The Wisdom of Father Brown by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 5 The Mistake of the Machine Flambeau and his friend the priest were sitting in the temple gardens about sunset, and their neighbourhood or some such accidental influence had turned their talk to matters of legal process. From the problem of the licence in cross-examination, their talk strayed to Roman and medieval torture, to the examining magistrate in France, and the third degree in America. "'I've been reading,' said Flambeau, "'of this new psychometric method they talk about so much, especially in America. You know what I mean. They put a pulsometer on a man's wrist, and judge by how his heart goes at the pronunciation of certain words. What do you think of it?' I think it's very interesting, replied Father Brown. It reminds me of that interesting idea in the Dark Ages that blood would flow from a corpse if the murderer touched it. Do you really mean, demanded his friend, that you think the two methods are equally valuable? I think them equally value less, replied Brown. Blood flows, fast or slow, in dead folk or living, for so many more million reasons than we can ever know. Blood will have to flow very funnily, blood will have to flow up the Matterhorn, before I will take it as a sign that I am to shed it. The method, remarked the other, has been guaranteed by some of the greatest American men of science. What sentimentalists men of science are, exclaimed Father Brown, and how much more sentimental must American men of science be? Who but a Yankee would think of proving anything from heartthrobs? Why, they must be as sentimental as a man who thinks a woman is in love with him if she blushes. That's a test from the circulation of the blood, discovered by the immortal Harvey, and a jolly rotten test, too. But surely, insisted Flambeau, it might point pretty straight at something or other. There's a disadvantage in a stick pointing straight, answered the other. What is it? Why, the other end of the stick always points the opposite way. It depends whether you get hold of the stick by the right end. I saw the thing done once, and I've never believed in it since. And he proceeded to tell the story of his disillusionment. It happened nearly twenty years before, when he was chaplain to his co-religionists in a prison in Chicago, where the Irish population displayed a capacity both for crime and penitence which kept him tolerably busy. The official second-in-command under the governor was an ex-detective named Greywood Usher, a cadaverous, carefully spoken Yankee philosopher, occasionally varying a very rigid visage with an odd, apologetic grimace. He liked Father Brown in a slightly patronising way, and Father Brown liked him, though he heartily disliked his theories. His theories were extremely complicated and were held with extreme simplicity. One evening he had sent for the priest, who, according to his custom, took a seat in silence at a table piled and littered with papers, and waited. The official selected from the papers a scrap of newspaper cutting, which he handed across to the cleric, who read it gravely. It appeared to be an extract from one of the pinkest of American society papers, and ran as follows. Society's brightest widower is once more on the freak dinner stunt. All our exclusive citizens will recall the perambulator parade dinner, in which last trick Todd, at his palatial home at Pilgrim's Pond, caused so many of our prominent debutants to look even younger than their years. Equally elegant and more miscellaneous and large-hearted in social outlook was last trick's show the year previous the popular Cannibal Crush Lunch, at which the confections handed round were sarcastically moulded in the forms of human arms and legs, and during which more than one of our gayest mental gymnasts was heard offering to eat his partner. The witticism which will inspire this evening is as yet in Mr. Todd's pretty reticent intellect, or locked in the jewelled bosoms of our city's gayest leaders. But there is talk of a pretty parody of the simple manners and customs at the other end of society's scale. This will be all the more telling, as hospitable Todd is entertaining in Lord Falconroy, the famous traveller, a true-blooded aristocrat 
fresh from England's oak groves. Lord Falconroy's travels began before his ancient feudal title was resurrected. He was in the Republic in his youth, and fashion murmurs a sly reason for his return. Miss Etta Todd is one of our deep-souled New Yorkers, and comes into an income of nearly twelve hundred million dollars. Well, asked Usher, does that interest you? My words rather fail me, answered Father Brown. I cannot think at this moment of anything in this world that would interest me less. And unless the just anger of the Republic is at last going to electrocute journalists for writing like that, I don't quite see why it should interest you either. Ah, said Mr. Usher dryly, and handing across another scrap of newspaper, well, does that interest you? The paragraph was headed, Savage Murder of a Warder, Convict Escapes, and ran. Just before dawn this morning, a shout for help was heard in the convict settlement at Sequa, in this state. The authorities, hurrying in the direction of the cry, found the corpse of the warder who patrols the top of the north wall of the prison, the steepest and most difficult exit, for which one man has always been found sufficient. The unfortunate officer had, however, been hurled from the high wall, his brains beaten out as with a club, and his gun was missing. Further inquiries show that one of the cells was empty. It had been occupied by a rather sullen ruffian, giving his name as Oscar Rian. He was only temporarily detained for some comparatively trivial assault, but he gave everyone the impression of a man with a black past and a dangerous future. Finally, when daylight had fully revealed the scene of murder, it was found that he had written on the wall above the body a fragmentary sentence, apparently with a finger dipped in blood. This was self-defence, and he had the gun. I meant no harm to him or any man but one. I am keeping the bullet for Pilgrim's Pond. Signed O.R. A man must have used most fiendish treachery or most savage and amazing bodily daring to have stormed such a wall in spite of an armed man. Well, the literary style is somewhat improved, admitted the priest cheerfully, but still I don't see what I can do for you. I should cut a poor figure with my short legs running about this state after an athletic assassin of that sort. I doubt whether anybody could find him. The convict settlement at Sequoia is thirty miles from here. The country between is wild and tangled enough, and the country beyond, where he will surely have the sense to go, is a perfect no-man's land, tumbling away to the prairies. He may be in any hole or up any tree. He isn't in any hole, said the governor. He isn't up any tree. Why, how do you know? asked Father Brown, blinking. Would you like to speak to him? inquired Usher. Father Brown opened his innocent eyes wide. He's here, he exclaimed. Why, how did your men get hold of him? I got hold of him myself, drawled the American, rising and lazily stretching his lanky legs before the fire. I got hold of him with the crooked end of a walking stick. Don't look so surprised. I really did. You know I sometimes take a turn in the country lanes outside this dismal place. Well, I was walking early this evening up a steep lane with dark hedges and grey-looking ploughed fields on both sides, and a young moon was up and silvering the road. By the light of it I saw a man running across the field towards the road, running with his body bent and at a good mile-race trot. He appeared to be much exhausted, but when he came to the thick black hedge he went through it as if it were made of spider's webs or rather, for I heard the strong branches breaking and snapping like bayonets, as if he himself were made of stone. In the instant in which he appeared up against the moon, crossing the road, I slung my hooked cane at his legs, tripping him and bringing him down. Then I blew my whistle, long and loud, and our fellows came running up to secure him. It would have been rather awkward, remarked Brown, if you had found he was a popular athlete practising a mile race. He was not, said Usher grimly. We soon found out who he was, but I had guessed it with the first glint of the moon on him. You thought it was the runaway convict, observed the priest simply, because you had read in the newspaper cutting that morning that a convict had run away. 
I had somewhat better grounds, replied the governor coolly. I pass over the first as too simple to be emphasized. I mean that fashionable athletes do not run across ploughed fields or scratch their eyes out in bramble hedges, nor do they run all doubled up like a crouching dog. There were more decisive details to a fairly well-trained eye. The man was clad in coarse and ragged clothes, but they were something more than merely coarse and ragged. They were so ill-fitting as to be quite grotesque. Even as he appeared in black outline against the moonrise, the coat collar in which his head was buried made him look like a hunchback, and the long loose sleeves looked as if he had no hands. It at once occurred to me that he had somehow managed to change his convict clothes for some confederate's clothes which did not fit him. Second, there was a pretty stiff wind against which he was running, so that I must have seen the streaky look of blowing hair if the hair had not been very short. Then I remembered that beyond these ploughed fields he was crossing lay Pilgrim's Pond, for which, you will remember, the convict was keeping his bullet, and I sent my walking-stick flying. A brilliant piece of rapid deduction, said Father Brown. But had he got a gun? As Usher stopped abruptly in his walk, the priest added apologetically, I've been told a bullet is not half so useful without it. He had no gun, said the other gravely, but that was doubtless due to some very natural mischance or change of plans. Probably the same policy that made him change the clothes made him drop the gun. He began to repent the coat he had left behind him in the blood of his victim. Well, that's possible enough, answered the priest. And it's hardly worth speculating on, said Usher, turning to some other papers, for we know it's the man by this time. His clerical friend asked faintly, but how? And Greywood Usher threw down the newspapers and took up the two press cuttings again. Well, since you are so obstinate, he said, let's begin at the beginning. You will notice that these two cuttings have only one thing in common, which is the mention of Pilgrim's Pond, the estate, as you know, of the millionaire Ireton Todd. You also know that he is a remarkable character, one of those that rose on stepping stones of our dead selves to higher things, assented his companion. Yes, I know that. Petroleum, I think. Anyhow, said Usher, last trick, Todd, counts for a great deal in this rum affair. He stretched himself once more before the fire, and continued talking in his expansive, radiantly explanatory style. To begin with, on the face of it, there is no mystery here at all. It is not mysterious, it is not even odd, that a jailbird should take his gun to Pilgrim's Pond. Our people aren't like the English, who will forgive a man for being rich if he throws away money on hospitals or horses. Last trick Todd has made himself big by his own considerable abilities. And there's no doubt that many of those on whom he has shown his abilities would like to show theirs on him with a shotgun. Todd might easily get dropped by some man he's never even heard of, some labourer he's locked out, or some clerk in a business he's busted. Last trick is a man of mental endowments and a high public character. But in this country the relations of employees and employed are considerably strained. That's how the whole thing looks, supposing this Rianne made for Pilgrim's Pond to kill Todd. So it looked to me, till another little discovery woke up what I have of the detective in me. When I had my prisoner safe, I picked up my cane again, and strolled down the two or three turns of country road that brought me to one of the side entrances of Todd's grounds, the one nearest to the pool or lake after which the place is named. It was some two hours ago, about seven by this time. The moon was more luminous, and I could see the long white streaks of it lying on the mysterious mere with its grey, greasy, half-liquid shores, in which they say our fathers used to make witches walk until they sank. I have forgotten the exact tale, but you know the place I mean. It lies north of Todd's house, towards the wilderness, and has two queer wrinkled trees, so dismal that they look more like huge fungoids than decent foliage. As I stood peering at this misty pool, I fancied I saw the faint figure of a man moving from the house towards it. But it was all too dim and distant for me to be certain of the fact, and still less of the details. Besides, my attention was very sharply arrested by something much closer. I crouched behind the fence, which ran not more than two hundred yards from one wing of the great mansion, and which was fortunately split in places, 
as especially for the application of a cautious eye. A door had opened in the dark bulk of the left wing, and a figure appeared black against the illuminated interior. A muffled figure bending forward, evidently peering out into the night. It closed the door behind it, and I saw it was carrying a lantern, which threw a patch of imperfect light on the dress and figure of the wearer. It seemed to be the figure of a woman, wrapped up in a ragged cloak, and evidently disguised to avoid notice. There was something very strange about the rags and the furtiveness in a person coming out of those rooms lined with gold. She took cautiously the curved garden path, which brought her within half a hundred yards of me. Then she stood up for an instant on the terrace of turf that looks towards the slimy lake, and holding her flaming lantern above her head, she deliberately swung it three times to and fro, as for a signal. As she swung it the second time, a flicker of its light fell for a moment on her own face, a face that I knew. She was unnaturally pale, and her head was bundled in her borrowed plebeian shawl, but I am certain it was Etta Todd, the millionaire's daughter. She retraced her steps in equal secrecy, and the door closed behind her again. I was about to climb the fence and follow, when I realised that the detective fever that had lured me into the adventure was rather undignified, and that, in a more authoritative capacity, I already held all the cards in my hand. I was just turning away when a new noise broke on the night. A window was thrown up in one of the upper floors, but just round the corner of the house so that I could not see it, and a voice of terrible distinctness was heard shouting across the dark garden to know where Lord Falconroy was, for he was missing from every room in the house. There was no mistaking that voice. I have heard it on many political platform or meeting of directors. It was Ireton Todd himself. Some of the others seemed to have gone to the lower windows or on to the steps, and were calling up to him that Falconroy had gone for a stroll down to the Pilgrim's Pond an hour before, and could not be traced since. Then Todd cried, Mighty murder, and shut down the window violently, and I could hear him plunging down the stairs inside. Repossessing myself of my former and wiser purpose, I whipped out of the way of the general search that must follow, and returned here not later than eight o'clock. I now ask you to recall that little society paragraph which seemed to you so painfully lacking in interest. If the convict was not keeping the shot for Todd, as he evidently wasn't, it is most likely that he was keeping it for Lord Falconroy. And it looks as if he had delivered the goods. No more handy place to shoot a man than in the curious geological surroundings of that pool, where a body thrown down would sink through thick slime to a depth practically unknown. Let us suppose, then, that our friend with the cropped hair came to kill Falconroy and not Todd. But, as I have pointed out, there are many reasons why people in America might want to kill Todd. There is no reason why anybody in America should want to kill an English lord newly landed, except for the one reason mentioned in the pink paper, that the lord is paying his attentions to the millionaire's daughter. Our crop-haired friend despite his ill-fitting clothes, must be an aspiring lover. I know the notion will seem to you jarring and even comic, but that's because you're English. It sounds to you like saying the Archbishop of Canterbury's daughter will be married in St. George's Hanover Square to a crossing sweeper on ticket leave. You don't do justice to the climbing and aspiring power of our more remarkable citizens. You see a good-looking grey-haired man in evening dress, with a sort of authority about him, and you know he is a pillar of the state, and you fancy he had a father. You are in error. You do not realise that a comparatively few years ago he may have been in a tenement, or, quite likely, in a jail. You don't allow for our national buoyancy and uplift. Many of our most influential citizens have not only risen recently, but risen comparatively late in life. Todd's daughter was fully eighteen when her father first made his pile, so there isn't really anything impossible in her having a hanger-on in low life, or even in her hanging on to him, as I think she must be doing to judge by the lantern business. If so, the hand that held the lantern may not be unconnected with the hand that held the gun, 
This case, sir, will make a noise. Well, said the priest patiently, and what did you do next? I reckon you'll be shocked, replied Greywood Usher, as I know you don't cotton to the march of science in these matters. I am given a good deal of discretion here, and perhaps take a little more than I am given. And I thought it was an excellent opportunity to test that psychometric machine I told you about. Now, in my opinion, that machine can't lie. No machine can lie, said Father Brown, nor can it tell the truth. It did in this case, as I'll show you, went on Usher positively. I sat the man in the ill-fitting clothes in a comfortable chair, and simply wrote words on a blackboard. And the machine simply recorded the variations of his pulse, and I simply observed his manner. The trick is to introduce some word connected with the supposed crime in a list of words connected with something quite different, yet a list in which it occurs quite naturally. Thus I wrote heron, and eagle, and owl, and when I wrote falcon, he was tremendously agitated, and when I began to make an R at the end of the word, that machine just bounded. Who else in this republic has any reason to jump at the name of a newly arrived Englishman like Falconroy, except the man who shot him? Isn't that better evidence than a lot of gabble from witnesses? It's the evidence of a reliable machine. You always forget, observed his companion, that the reliable machine always has to be worked by an unreliable machine. Why, what do you mean? asked the detective. I mean man, said Father Brown, the most unreliable machine I know of. I don't want to be rude, and I don't think you will consider man to be an offensive or inaccurate description of yourself. You say you observed his manner. But how do you know you observed it right? You say the words have to come in a natural way. But how do you know that you did it naturally? How do you know, if you come to that, that he did not observe your manner? Who is to prove that you were not tremendously agitated? There was no machine tied onto your pulse. I tell you, cried the American, in the utmost excitement, I was as cool as a cucumber. Criminals also can be as cool as cucumbers, said Brown, with a smile, and almost as cool as you. Well, this one wasn't, said Usher, throwing the papers about. Oh, you make me tired. I'm sorry, said the other. I only point out what seems a reasonable possibility. If you could tell by his manner when the word that might hang him had come, why shouldn't he tell from your manner that the word that might hang him was coming? I should ask for more than words myself before I hanged anybody. Usher smote the table, and rose in a sort of angry triumph. And that, he cried, is just what I'm going to give you. I tried the machine first, just in order to test the thing in other ways afterwards. And the machine, sir, is right. He paused a moment, and resumed with less excitement. I rather want to insist, if it comes to that, that so far I had very little to go on except the scientific experiment. There was really nothing against the man at all. His clothes were ill-fitting, as I've said, but they were rather better, if anything, than those of the submerged class to which he evidently belonged. Moreover, under all the stains of his plunging through ploughed fields, or bursting through dusty hedges, the man was comparatively clean. This might mean, of course, that he had only just broken prison but it reminded me more of the desperate decency of the comparatively respectable poor. His demeanour was, I am bound to confess, quite in accordance with theirs. He was silent and dignified as they are. He seemed to have a big but buried grievance as they do. He professed total ignorance of the crime and the whole question, and showed nothing but a sullen impatience for something sensible that might come to take him out of his meaningless scrape. He asked me more than once if he could telephone for a lawyer who had helped him a long time ago in a trade dispute, and in every sense acted as you would expect an innocent man to act. There was nothing against him in the world except that little finger on the dial that pointed to the change of his pulse. Then, sir, the machine was on its trial, and the machine was right. By the time I came with him out of the private room into the vestibule, where all sorts of other people were awaiting examination, I think he had already more or less made up his mind to clearing things up by something like a confession. He turned to me and began to say in a low voice, Oh, I can't stick this any more. If you must know all about me. 
At the same instant one of the poor women sitting on the long bench stood up, screaming aloud and pointing at him with her finger. I have never in my life heard anything more demonically distinct. Her lean finger seemed to pick him out as if it were a pea-shooter. Though the word was a mere howl, every syllable was as clear as a separate stroke on a clock. Drugger Davis, she shouted. They've got Drugger Davis. Among the wretched women, mostly thieves and street-walkers, twenty faces were turned, gaping with glee and hate. If I had never heard the words, I should have known by the very shock upon his features that the so-called Oscar Rian had heard his real name. But I am not quite so ignorant, you may be surprised to hear. Drugger Davis was one of the most terrible and depraved criminals that ever baffled our police. It is certain that he had done murder more than once, long before his exploit with the warder. But he was never entirely fixed for it, curiously enough because he did it in the same manner as those milder or meaner crimes for which he was fixed pretty often. He was a handsome, well-bred-looking brute, as he still is to some extent, and he used mostly to go about with barmaids or shop-girls and do them out of their money. Very often, though, he went a good deal farther and they were found drugged with cigarettes or chocolates, and their whole property missing. Then came one case where the girl was found dead, but deliberation could not quite be proved, and, what was more practical still, the criminal could not be found. I heard a rumour of his having reappeared somewhere in the opposite character this time, lending money instead of borrowing it. But still to such poor widows as he might personally fascinate, but still with the same bad result for them. Well, there is your innocent man, and there is his innocent record. Even since then, four criminals and three warders have identified him and confirmed the story. Now what have you got to say to my poor little machine after that? Hasn't the machine done for him? Or do you prefer to say that the women and I have done for him? "'As to what you've done for him,' replied Father Brown, rising and shaking himself in a floppy way, "'you've saved him from the electrical chair. "'I don't think they can kill Duggar Davis on that old vague story of the poison. "'And as for the convict who killed the warder, I suppose it's obvious that you haven't got him. "'Mr. Davis is innocent of that crime, at any rate.' "'What do you mean?' demanded the other. "'Why should he be innocent of that crime?' "'Why, "'Bless us all!' cried the small man in one of his rare moments of animation. "'Why, because he's guilty of the other crimes. I don't know what you people are made of. You seem to think that all sins are kept together in a bag. You talk as if a miser on Monday were always a spendthrift on Tuesday. You tell me that this man you have here spent weeks and months wheedling needy women out of small sums of money, that he used a drug at best and a poison at the worst.' that he turned up afterwards as the lowest kind of money-lender, and cheated most poor people in the same patient and pacific style. Let it be granted, let us admit, for the sake of argument, that he did all this. If that is so, I'll tell you what he didn't do. He didn't storm a spiked wall against a man with a loaded gun. He didn't write on the wall with his own hand to say he had done it. He didn't stop to state that his justification was self-defence. He didn't explain that he had no quarrel with the poor warder. He didn't name the house of the rich man to which he was going with the gun. He didn't write his own initials in a man's blood. Saints alive! Can't you see the whole character is different in good and evil? Why, you don't seem to be like I am a bit. One would think you'd never had any vices of your own. The amazed American had already parted his lips in protest when the door of his private and official room was hammered and rattled in an unceremonious way to which he was totally unaccustomed. The door flew open. The moment before, Greywood Usher had been coming to the conclusion that Father Brown might possibly be mad. The moment after, he began to think he was mad himself. There burst and fell into his private room a man in the filthiest rags, with a greasy squash hat still askew on his head, and a shabby green shade shoved up from one of his eyes both of which were glaring like tigers. The rest of his face was almost undiscoverable, being masked with a matted beard and whiskers, through which the nose could barely thrust itself, and further buried in a squalid red scarf or handkerchief. 
Mr. Usher prided himself on having seen most of the roughest specimens in the state, but he thought he had never seen such a baboon dressed as a scarecrow as this, but above all, he had never in all his placid scientific existence heard a man like that speak to him first. "'See here, old man Usher,' shouted the being in the red handkerchief. "'I'm getting tired. Don't you try any of your hide-and-seek on me. I don't get fooled any. Leave go of my guests, and I'll let up on the fancy clockwork. Keep him here for a split instant, and you'll feel pretty mean. I reckon I'm not a man with no pull.' The eminent usher was regarding the bellowing monster with an amazement which had dried up all other sentiments. The mere shock to his eyes had rendered his ears almost useless. At last he rang a bell with a hand of violence. While the bell was still strong and pealing, the voice of Father Brown fell soft but distinct. "'I have a suggestion to make,' he said, but it seems a little confusing. I don't know this gentleman, but, but I think I know him. Now, you know him, you know him quite well, but you don't know him, naturally. Sounds paradoxical, I know. I reckon the cosmos is cracked, said Usher, and fell a sprawl in his round office chair. Now, see here, vociferated the stranger, striking the table, but speaking in a voice that was all the more mysterious, because it was comparatively mild and rational, though still resounding. I won't let you in. I want... "'Who in hell are you?' yelled Usher, suddenly sitting up straight. "'I think the gentleman's name is Todd,' said the priest. Then he picked up the pink slip of newspaper. "'I fear you don't read the society papers properly,' he said, and began to read out in a monotonous voice. "'Or locked in the jewel bosoms of our city's gayest leaders, that there is talk of a petty parody of the manners and customs of the other end of society's scale.' There's been a big slum dinner up at Pilgrim's Pond tonight, and a man, one of the guests, disappeared. Mr. Arden Todd is a good host, and has tracked him here, without even waiting to take off his fancy dress. What do you mean? I mean the man with comically ill-fitting clothes you saw, running across the ploughed field. Hadn't you better go and investigate him? He will be rather impatient to get back to his champagne, from which he ran away in such a hurry when the convict with the gun hove in sight. "'Do you seriously mean?' began the official. "'Why, look here, Mr. Usher,' said Father Brown quietly, "'you said the machine couldn't make a mistake, and in one sense it didn't. "'But the other machine did, the machine that worked it. "'You assumed that the man in rags jumped at the name of Lord Falconroy, "'because he was Lord Falconroy's murderer. "'He jumped at the name of Lord Falconroy because he is Lord Falconroy.' "'Then why the blazes didn't he say so?' demanded the staring usher. "'He felt his plight and recent panic were hardly patrician,' replied the priest, "'so he tried to keep the name back at first. "'But he was just going to tell it you when—' "'And Father Brown looked down at his boots. "'When a woman found another name for him.' "'But you can't be so mad as to say,' said Greywood Usher, very white, "'that Lord Falconroy was Drugger Davis.' The priest looked at him very earnestly, but with a baffling and undecipherable face. "'I'm not saying anything about it,' he said. "'I leave all the rest to you. Your pink paper says that the title was recently revived for him. But those papers are very unreliable. It says he was in the States in youth, but the whole story seems very strange. Davis and Falconroy are both pretty considerable cowards, but so are lots of men.' I would not hang a dog on my opinion about this, but I think, he went on softly and reflectively, I think you Americans are too modest. I think you idealise the English aristocracy, even in assuming it to be so aristocratic. You see a good-looking Englishman in evening dress, you know he's in the House of Lords, and you fancy he has a father. You don't allow for our national buoyancy and uplift. Many of our most influential noblemen have not only risen recently, but— "'Oh, stop it!' cried Greywood Usher, wringing one lean hand in impatience against a shade of irony in the other's face. "'Don't stay talking to this lunatic!' cried Todd brutally. "'Take me to my friend!' Next morning Father Brown appeared with the same demure expression, carrying yet another piece of pink newspaper. "'I'm afraid you neglect the fashionable press, rather,' he said, "'but this cutting may interest you.' 
Usher read the headlines. Last trick strayed revellers. Mirthful incident near Pilgrim's Pond. The paragraph went on. A laughable occurrence took place outside Wilkinson's motor garage last night. A policeman on duty had his attention drawn by larrikins to a man in prison dress who was stepping with considerable coolness into the steering seat of a pretty high-toned panhard. He was accompanied by a girl wrapped in a ragged shawl. On the police interfering, the young woman threw back her shawl and all recognised millionaire Todd's daughter, who had just come from the slum freak dinner at the pond, where all the choicest guests were in a similar déshabille. She and the gentleman, who had donned prison uniform, were going for the customary joy-ride. Under the pink slip, Mr. Usher found a strip of a later paper, headed, Astounding Escape of Millionaire's Daughter with Convict. She had arranged freak dinner, now safe in. Mr. Greenwood Usher lifted his eyes, but Father Brown was gone. Chapter 6 The Head of Caesar There is, somewhere in Brompton or Kensington, an interminable avenue of tall houses, rich but largely empty, that looks like a terrace of tombs. The very steps up to the dark front doors seem as steep as the side of pyramids. One would hesitate to knock at the door, lest it should be opened by a mummy. But a yet more depressing feature in the grey façade is its telescopic length and changeless continuity. The pilgrim walking down it begins to think he will never come to a break or a corner. But there is one exception, a very small one but hailed by the pilgrim almost with a shout. There is a sort of muse between two of the tall mansions, a mere slit like the crack of a door by comparison with the street, but just large enough to permit a pygmy alehouse or eating-house, still allowed by the rich to their stable servants, to stand in the angle. There is something cheery in its very dinginess, and something free and elfin in its very insignificance. At the feet of those grey stone giants it looks like a lighted house of dwarves. Anyone passing the place during a certain autumn evening, itself almost fairy-like, might have seen a hand pull aside the red half-blind, which, along with some large white lettering, half hid the interior from the street, and a face peer out, not unlike a rather innocent goblin's. It was, in fact, the face of one with the harmless human name of Brown, formerly priest of Cobble in Essex, and now working in London. His friend, Flambeau, a semi-official investigator, was sitting opposite him and making his last notes of a case he had cleared up in the neighbourhood. They were sitting at a small table, close up to the window, when the priest pulled the curtain back and looked out. He waited till a stranger in the street had passed the window, to let the curtain fall into its place again. Then his round eyes rolled to the large white lettering on the window above his head, and then strayed to the next table, at which sat only a navvy with beer and cheese, and a young girl with red hair and a glass of milk. Then, seeing his friend put away the pocket-book, he said softly, "'If you've got ten minutes, I wish you'd follow that man with a false nose.' Flambeau looked up in surprise, but the girl with the red hair also looked up, and was something that was stronger than astonishment. She was simply and even loosely dressed in light brown sacking stuff, but she was a lady, and even, on a second glance, a rather needlessly haughty one. "'The man with a false nose,' repeated Flambeau. "'Who's he?' "'I haven't a notion,' asked Father Brown. "'I want you to find out. "'I ask it as a favour. "'He went down there, and he jerked his thumb over his shoulder "'in one of his undistinguished gestures. "'And can't have passed three lamp-posts yet. "'I only want to know the direction.' "'Flambeau gazed at his friend for some time, "'with an expression between perplexity and amusement, "'and then, rising from the table, squeezed his huge form out of the little door of the dwarf tavern and melted into the twilight father brown took a small book out of his pocket and began to read steadily 
he betrayed no consciousness of the fact that the red-haired lady had left her own table and sat down opposite him. At last she leaned over and said in a low, strong voice, "'Why do you say that? How do you know it's false?' He lifted his rather heavy eyelids, which fluttered in considerable embarrassment. Then his dubious eye roamed again to the white lettering on the glass front of the public house. The young woman's eyes followed his and rested there also, but in pure puzzled them. No, said Father Brown, answering her thoughts, it doesn't say cellar like the thing in the Psalms. I read it like that myself when I was wool gathering just now. It says ales. Well, inquired the staring young lady, what does it matter what it says? His ruminating eye moved to the girl's light canvas sleeve, round the wrist of which ran a very slight thread of artistic pattern, just enough to distinguish it from a working dress of a common woman, and make it more like the working dress of a lady art student. He seemed to find much food for thought in this, but his reply was very slow and hesitant. "'You see, madam,' he said, "'from the outside the place looks... "'Well, it is a perfectly decent place, but ladies like you don't don't generally think so. "'They never go into such places from choice, except—' "'Well,' she repeated, "'except an unfortunate few who don't go in to drink milk.' "'You are a most singular person,' said the young lady. "'What is your object in all this?' "'Not to trouble you about it,' he replied very gently only to arm myself with knowledge enough to help you, if ever you freely ask my help. But why should I need help? He continued his dreamy monologue. You couldn't have come in to see protégés, humble friends, or that sort of thing, or you'd have gone through into the parlour. And you couldn't have come in because you were ill, or you'd have spoken to the woman of the place, who's obviously respectable. Besides, you don't look ill in that way, but only unhappy. This street is the only original long lane that has no turning. And the houses on both sides are shut up. I could only suppose that you had seen somebody coming whom you didn't want to meet, and found the public house was the only shelter in this wilderness of stone. I don't think I went beyond the license of a stranger in glancing at the only man who passed immediately after, and as I thought he looked like the wrong sort, and you looked like the right sort, I held myself ready to help. If he annoyed you, that is all. As for my friend, he'll be back soon, and he certainly can't find out anything by stumping down a road like this. I didn't think he could. Then why did you send him out, she cried, leaning forward with yet warmer curiosity. She had the proud, impetuous face that goes with reddish colouring and a Roman nose, as it did in Marie Antoinette. He looked at her steadily for the first time, and said, because I hoped you would speak to me. She looked back at him for some time with a heated face, in which there hung a red shadow of anger. Then, despite her anxieties, humour broke out of her eyes and the corners of her mouth, and she answered almost grimly, Well, if you are so keen on my conversation, perhaps you'll answer my question. After a pause, she added, I had the honour to ask you why you thought the man's nose was false. The wax always spots like that, just a little in this weather, answered Father Brown with entire simplicity. But it's such a crooked nose, remonstrated the red-haired girl. The priest smiled in his turn. I don't say it's the sort of nose one would wear out of mere foppery, he admitted. This man, I think, wears it because his real nose is so much nicer. But why? she insisted. What is the nursery rhyme? observed Brown absent-mindedly. There was a crooked man, and he went a crooked mile. That man, I fancy, has gone a very crooked road by following his nose. Why, what's he done? she demanded rather shakily. I don't want to force your confidence by a hair, said Father Brown very quietly, but I think you could tell me more about that than I can tell you. The girl sprang to her feet and stood quietly but with clenched hands like one about to stride away. Then her hands loosened slowly, and she sat down again. 
"'You are more of a mystery than all the others,' she said desperately. "'But I feel there might be a heart in your mystery.' What we all dread most, said the priest, in a low voice, is a maze with no centre. That is why atheism is only a nightmare. I will tell you everything, said the red-haired girl doggedly, except why I am telling you, and that I don't know. She picked at the darned tablecloth and went on, You look as if you knew what isn't snobbery as well as what is, and when I say that ours is a good family, you'll understand it is a necessary part of the story. Indeed, my chief danger is in my brother's high and dry notions, noblesse oblige and all that. Well, my name is Christabel Carstairs, and my father was that Colonel Carstairs you've probably heard of, who made the famous Carstairs collection of Roman coins. I could never describe my father to you. The nearest I can say is that he was very like a Roman coin himself. He was as handsome and as genuine and as valuable and as metallic and as out of date. He was prouder of his collection than of his coat of arms. Nobody could say more than that. His extraordinary character came out most in his will. He had two sons and one daughter. He quarrelled with one son, my brother Giles, and sent him to Australia on a small allowance. He then made a will leaving the Carstairs collection, actually with a yet smaller allowance to my brother Arthur. He meant it as a reward, as the highest honour he could offer, in the acknowledgment of Arthur's loyalty and rectitude, and the distinctions he had already gained in mathematics and economics at Cambridge. He left me practically all his pretty large fortune, and I'm sure he meant it in contempt. Arthur, you may say, might well complain of this, but Arthur is my father over again. Though he had some differences with my father in early youth, no sooner had he taken over the collection than he became like a pagan priest dedicated to a temple. He mixed up these Roman halfpence with the honour of the Carstairs family in the same stiff, idolatrous way as his father before him. He acted as if Roman money must be guarded by all the Roman virtues. He took no pleasures, he spent nothing on himself, he lived for the collection. Often he would not trouble to dress for his simple meals, but pattered about among the corded brown paper parcels, which no one else was allowed to touch, in an old brown dressing gown. With its rope and tassel and his pale, thin, refined face, it made him look like an old ascetic monk. Every now and then, though, he would appear dressed like a decidedly fashionable gentleman. But that was only when he went up to the London sales, or shops, to make an addition to the Carstairs collection. Now, if you've known any young people, you won't be shocked if I say that I got into rather a low frame of mind with all this. The frame of mind in which one begins to say that the ancient Romans were all very well in their way. I'm not like my brother Arthur. I can't help enjoying enjoyment. I got a lot of romance and rubbish when I got my red hair from the other side of the family. Poor Giles was the same, and I think the atmosphere of coins might count in excuse for him though he really did wrong and nearly went to prison. But he didn't behave any worse than I did, as you shall hear. I come now to the silly part of the story. I think a man as clever as you can guess the sort of thing that would begin to relieve the monotony for an unruly girl of seventeen placed in such a position. But I am so rattled with more dreadful things that I can hardly read my own feeling, and don't know whether I despise it now as a flirtation or bear it as a broken heart. We lived then at a little seaside watering place in South Wales, and a retired sea captain living a few doors off had a son about five years older than myself, who had been a friend of Giles before he went to the colonies. His name does not affect my tale, but I tell you it was Philip Hawker, because I am telling you everything. We used to go shrimping together, and said and thought we were in love with each other, at least he certainly said he was, and I certainly thought I was. If I tell you he had bronzed curly hair and a falconish sort of face, bronzed by the sea also, it's not for his sake, I assure you, but for the story, for it was the cause of a very curious coincidence. One summer afternoon, when I had promised to go shrimping along the sands with Philip, I was waiting rather impatiently in the front drawing-room, watching Arthur handle some packets of coins he had just purchased, and slowly shunt them one or two at a time into his own dark study and museum, which was at the back of the house. 
As soon as I heard the heavy door close on him finally, I made a bolt for my shrimping net and tam o and was just going to slip out when I saw that my brother had left behind him one coin that lay gleaming on the long bench by the window. It was a bronze coin, and the colour, combined with the exact curve of the Roman nose and something in the very lift of the long, wiry neck, made the head of Caesar on it the almost precise portrait of Philip Hawker. Then I suddenly remembered Giles telling Philip of a coin that was like him, and Philip wishing he had it. Perhaps you can fancy the wild, foolish thoughts with which my head went round. I felt as if I had had a gift from the fairies. It seemed to me that if I could only run away with this and give it to Philip like a wild sort of wedding ring, it would be a bond between us for ever. I felt a thousand such things at once. Then they yawned under me like the pit, the enormous, awful notion of what I was doing. Above all, the unbearable thought, which was like touching hot iron, of what Arthur would think of it, a caster as a thief, and a thief of the caster's treasure. I believe my brother could see me burned like a witch for such a thing. But then the very thought of such fanatical cruelty heightened my old hatred of his dingy old antiquarian fussiness, and my longing for the youth and liberty that called to me from the sea. Outside was strong sunlight with a wind, and a yellow head of some broom or gorse in the garden wrapped against the glass of the window. I thought of that living and growing gold calling to me from all the heaths of the world, and then of that dead, dull gold and bronze and brass of my brothers, growing dustier and dustier as life went by. Nature and the Carstairs collection had come to grips at last. Nature is older than the Carstairs collection. As I ran down the streets to the sea, the coin clenched tight in my fist. I felt all the Roman Empire on my back, as well as the Carstairs pedigree. It was not only the old lion argent that was roaring in my ear, but all the eagles of the Caesars seemed flapping and screaming in pursuit of me. And yet my heart rose higher and higher like a child's kite, until I came over the very loose, dry sand-hills, and to the flat, wet sands, where Philip stood already up to his ankles in the shallow, shining water, some hundred yards out to sea. There was a great red sunset, and the long stretch of low water, hardly rising over the ankle for half a mile, was like a lake of ruby flame. It was not till I had torn off my shoes and stockings, and waded out to where he stood, which was well away from the dry land, that I turned and looked around. We were quite alone in a circle of sea-water and wet sand, and I gave him the head of Caesar. At the very instant I had a shock of fancy that a man far away on the sand-hills was looking at me intently. I must have felt immediately after that it was a mere leap of unreasonable nerves, for the man was only a dark dot in the distance, and I could only just see that he was standing quite still and gazing, with his head a little to one side. There was no earthly logical evidence that he was looking at me. He might have been looking at the ship, or the sunset, or the seagulls or at any of the people who were still strayed here and there on the shore between us. Nevertheless, whatever my start sprang from was prophetic, for as I gazed he started walking briskly in a bee-line towards us across the wide, wet sands. As he drew nearer and nearer I saw that he was dark and bearded, and that his eyes were marked with dark spectacles. He was dressed poorly but respectably in black, from the old black top hat on his head to the solid black boots on his feet. In spite of these he walked straight into the sea without a flash of hesitation, and came on at me with the steadiness of a travelling bullet. I can't tell you the sense of monstrosity and miracle I had when he thus silently burst the barrier between land and water. It was as if he had walked straight off a cliff, and still marched steadily in mid-air. It was as if a house had flown up into the sky, or a man's head had fallen off. He was only wetting his boots, but he seemed to be a demon disregarding a law of nature. If he had hesitated an instant at the water's edge, it would have been nothing. As it was, he seemed to look so much at me alone as not to notice the ocean. Philip was some yards away, with his back to me, bending over his net. 
The stranger came on till he stood within two yards of me, the water washing halfway up his knees. Then he said, with a clearly modulated and rather mincing articulation, Would it discommode you to contribute elsewhere a coin with a somewhat different superscription? With one exception, there was nothing definably abnormal about him. His tinted glasses were not really opaque, but of a blue kind common enough, nor his eyes behind them shifty, but regarded me steadily. His dark beard was not really long or wild, but he looked rather hairy, because the beard began very high up in his face, just under the cheekbones. His complexion was neither sallow nor livid, but on the contrary rather clear and youthful. Yet this gave a pink-and-white waxed look, which somehow, I don't know why, rather increased the horror. The only oddity one could fix was that his nose, which was otherwise of a good shape, was just slightly turned sideways at the tip, as if, when it was soft, it had been tapped on one side with a toy hammer. The thing was hardly a deformity, yet I cannot tell you what a living nightmare it was to me. As he stood there in the sunset-stained water, he affected me as some hellish sea-monster just risen roaring out of a sea like blood. I don't know why a touch on the nose should affect my imagination so much. I think it seemed as if he could move his nose like a finger, and as if he had just that moment moved it. Any little assistance, he continued with the same queer priggish accent, that may obviate the necessity of my communicating with the family. Then it rushed over me that I was being blackmailed for the theft of the bronze piece and all my merely superstitious fears and doubts were swallowed up in one overpowering practical question. How could he have found out? I had stolen the thing suddenly and on impulse. I was certainly alone, for I always made sure of being unobserved when I slipped out to see Philip in this way. I had not, to all appearances, been followed in the street, and if I had, they could not X-ray the coin in my closed hands. The man standing on the sand-hills could no more have seen what I gave Philip and shoot a fly in one eye, like the man in the fairy tale. "'Philip,' I cried helplessly, "'ask this man what he wants.' When Philip lifted his head at last from mending his net, he looked rather red, as if sulky or ashamed. But it may have been only the exertion of stooping and the red evening light. I may have only had another of the morbid fancies that seemed to be dancing about me. He merely gruffly said to the man, "'You clear out of this.' and motioning me to follow, set off wading shoreward without paying further attention to him. He stepped onto a stone breakwater that ran out from among the roots of the sand-hills, and so struck homeward, perhaps thinking our incubus would find it less easy to walk on such rough stones, green and slippery with seaweed, than we who were young and used to it. But my persecutor walked as daintily as he talked, and he still followed me, picking his way and picking his phrases. I heard his delicate, detestable voice appealing to me over my shoulder, until at last, when we had crested the sand-hills, Philip's patience, which was by no means so conspicuous on most occasions, seemed to snap. He turned suddenly, saying, "'Go back, I can't talk to you now.' And as the man hovered and opened his mouth, Philip struck him a buffet on it that sent him flying from the top of the tallest sand-hill to the bottom. I saw him crawling out below, covered with sand. This stroke comforted me somehow, though it might well increase my peril, but Philip showed none of his usual elation at his own prowess. Though as affectionate as ever, he still seemed cast down. And before I could ask him anything fully, he parted with me at his own gate, with two remarks that struck me as strange. He said that, all things considered, I ought to put the coin back in the collection but that he himself would keep it for the present. And then he added, quite suddenly and irrelevantly, You know Giles is back from Australia. The door of the tavern opened, and the gigantic shadow of the investigator Flambeau fell across the table. Father Brown presented him to the lady in his own slight, persuasive style of speech, mentioning his knowledge and sympathy in such cases, and, almost without knowing, the girl was soon reiterating her story to two listeners, but Flambeau, as he bowed and sat down, handed the priest a small slip of paper. Brown accepted it with some surprise, and read on it, 
Cab to Wagga Wagga, 379 Mafeking Avenue, Putney. The girl was going on with her story. I went up the street to my own house with my head in a whirl. It had not begun to clear when I came to the doorstep, on which I found a milk can and the man with the twisted nose. The milk can told me the servants were all out, for, of course, Arthur, browsing about in his brown dressing gown in a brown study, would not hear or answer a bell. Thus there was no one to help me in the house except my brother, whose help must be my ruin. In desperation I thrust two shillings into the horrid thing's hand, and told him to call again in a few days when I had thought it out. He went off sulking, but more sheepishly than I had expected. Perhaps he had been shaken by his fall, and I watched the star of sand splashed on his back receding down the road with a horrid, vindictive pleasure. He turned a corner some six houses down. Then I let myself in, made myself some tea, and tried to think it out. I sat at the drawing-room window, looking on to the garden, which still glowed with the last full evening light. But I was too distracted and dreamy to look at the lawns and flower-pots and flower-beds with any concentration. So I took the shock the more sharply, because I'd seen it so slowly. The man or monster I'd sent away was standing quite still in the middle of the garden. Oh, we all read a lot about pale-faced phantoms in the dark, but this was more dreadful than anything of that kind could ever be, because, though he cast a long evening shadow, he still stood in warm sunlight, and because his face was not pale, but had that waxen bloom still upon it that belongs to a barber's dummy. He stood quite still, with his face towards me and I can't tell you how horrid he looked among the tulips and all those tall, gaudy, almost hothouse-looking flowers. It looked as if we'd stuck up a waxwork instead of a statue in the centre of our garden. Yet almost the instant he saw me move in the window, he turned and ran out of the garden by the back gate, which stood open, and by which he had undoubtedly entered. This renewed timidity on his part was so different from the impudence with which he had walked into the sea, that I felt vaguely comforted. I fancied, perhaps, that he feared confronting Arthur more than I knew. Anyhow, I settled down at last and had a quiet dinner alone, for it was against the rules to disturb Arthur when he was rearranging the museum. And my thoughts, a little released, fled to Philip and lost themselves, I suppose. Anyhow, I was looking blankly, but rather pleasantly than otherwise, at another window, uncurtained, but by this time black as slate with the final nightfall. It seemed to me that something like a snail was on the outside of the window-pane, but when I stared harder it was more like a man's thumb pressed on the pane. It had that curled look that a thumb has. With my fear and courage reawakened together, I rushed at the window and then recoiled with a strangled scream that any man but Arthur must have heard. For it was not a thumb, any more than it was a snail. It was the tip of a crooked nose crushed against the glass. It looked white with the pressure, and the staring face and eyes behind it were at first invisible, and afterwards grey like a ghost. I slammed the shutters together somehow, rushed up to my room, and locked myself in. But even as I passed I could swear I saw a second black window with something on it that was like a snail. It might be best to go to Arthur after all. If the thing was crawling close all around the house like a cat, it might have purposes worse even than blackmail. My brother might cast me out and curse me for ever, but he was a gentleman and would defend me on the spot. After ten minutes' curious thinking, I went down, knocked on the door, and then went in, to see the last and worst sight. My brother's chair was empty, and he was obviously out but the man with the crooked nose was sitting waiting for his return, with his hat still insolently on his head, and actually reading one of my brother's books under my brother's lamp. His face was composed and occupied, but his nose tip still had the air of being the most mobile part of his face, as if it had just turned from left to right like an elephant's proboscis. I had thought him poisonous enough while he was pursuing and watching me, but I think his unconsciousness of my presence was more frightful still. 
I think I screamed loud and long, but that doesn't matter. What I did next does matter. I gave him all the money I had, including a good deal in paper, which, though it was mine, I dare say I had no right to touch. He went off at last, with hateful, tactful regrets all in long words, and I sat down feeling ruined in every sense. And yet I was saved that very night by a pure accident. Arthur had gone off suddenly to London, as he so often did, for bargains, and returned late but radiant, having nearly secured a treasure that was an added splendour even to the family collection. He was so resplendent that I was almost emboldened to confess the abstraction of the lesser gem. But he bore down all other topics with his overpowering project. Because the bargain might still misfire at any moment, he insisted on my packing at once and going up with him to lodgings he had already taken in Fulham, to be near the curio shop in question. Thus, in spite of myself, I fled from my foe almost in the dead of night, but from Philip also. My brother was often at the South Kensington Museum, and, in order to make some sort of secondary life for myself, I paid for a few lessons at the art schools. I was coming back from them this evening, when I saw the abomination of desolation walking alive down the long straight street, and the rest is as this gentleman has said. I've got only one thing to say. I don't deserve to be helped, and I don't question or complain of my punishment. It is just it ought to have happened. But I still question, with bursting brains, how it can have happened. Am I punished by miracle? Or how can any one but Philip and myself know I gave him a tiny coin in the middle of the sea? It is an extraordinary problem, admitted Flambeau. Not so extraordinary as the answer, remarked Father Brown rather gloomily. Miss Carstairs, will you be at home if we call at your fulham place in an hour and a half hence? The girl looked at him, and then rose and put her gloves on. Yes, she said, I'll be there, and almost instantly left the place. That night the detective and the priest were still talking of the matter as they drew near the Fulham house, a tenement strangely mean even for the temporary residents of the Carstairs family. Of course the superficial, on reflection, said Flambeau, would think first of this Australian brother who has been in trouble before who's come back so suddenly, and who's just the man to have shabby confederates. But I can't see how he can come into the thing by any process of thought, unless— Well, asked his companion, patiently. Flambeau lowered his voice, unless the girl's lover comes in, too, and he would be the blacker villain. The Australian chap did know that Hawker wanted the coin, but I can't see how on earth he could know that Hawker had got it, unless Hawker signalled to him, or his representative, across the shore. "'That's true,' assented the priest, with respect. "'Have you noted another thing?' went on Flambeau eagerly. "'This hawker hears his love insulted, but doesn't strike till he's got to the soft sandhills, where he can be victor in a mere sham fight. If he'd struck amid rocks and sea, he might have hurt his ally.' "'That's true again,' said Father Brown, nodding. "'And now, take it from the start. It lies between few people, but at least three. You want one person for suicide?' two people for murder, but at least three people for blackmail. Why? asked the priest softly. Well, obviously, cried his friend, there must be one to be exposed, one to threaten exposure, and one at least whom exposure would horrify. After a long, ruminant pause, the priest said, You miss a logical step. Three persons are needed as ideas, only two are needed as agents. What can you mean? asked the other. Why shouldn't a blackmailer, asked Brown in a low voice, threaten his victim with himself? Suppose a wife became a rigid teetotaler in order to frighten her husband into concealing his pub frequenting, and then wrote him blackmailing letters in another hand threatening to tell his wife. Why shouldn't it work? Suppose a father forbade a son to gamble, and then, following him in a good disguise, threatened the boy with his own sham paternal strictness. Suppose... But here we are, my friend. My God, cried Flambeau, you don't mean... An active figure ran down the steps of the house, and showed under the golden lamplight the unmistakable head that resembled the Roman coin. Miss Carstairs, said Hawker, without ceremony, wouldn't go in till you came. Well, observed Brown confidently, 
Don't you think it's the best thing she can do to stop outside, with you to look after her? You see, I rather guess you've guessed it all yourself. Yes, said the young man in an undertone. I guessed on the sands, and now I know. That's why I let him fall soft. Taking a latch-key from the girl and a coin from Hawker, Flambeau let himself and his friend into the empty house and passed into the outer parlour. It was empty of all occupants but one. The man whom Father Brown had seen past the tavern was standing against the wall as if at bay. Unchanged, save that he had taken off his black coat and was wearing a brown dressing-gown. "'We have come,' said Father Brown politely, "'to give back this coin to its owner.' And he handed it to the man with the nose. Flambeau's eyes rolled. "'Is this man a coin-collector?' he asked. "'This man is Mr. Arthur Carstairs,' said the priest positively, "'and he is a coin-collector of a somewhat singular kind.' The man changed colour so horribly that the crooked nose stood out on his face like a separate and comic thing. He spoke, nevertheless, with a sort of despairing dignity. "'You shall see, then,' he said, "'that I have not lost all the family's qualities,' and he turned suddenly and strode into an inner room, slamming the door. "'Stop him!' shouted Father Brown, bounding and half falling over a chair. And, after a wrench or two, Flambeau had the door open but it was too late. In, in dead silence, Flambeau strode across and telephoned for a doctor and police. An empty medicine bottle lay on the floor. Across the table, the body of the man in the brown dressing gown lay amid his burst and gaping brown paper parcels, out of which poured and rolled, not Roman, but very modern, English coins. The priest held up the bronze head of Caesar. This, he said, was all that was left of the Carstairs collection. After a silence he went on with more than common gentleness. It was a cruel will that his father made, and you see he did resent it a little. He hated the Roman money he had, and grew fonder of the real money denied him. He not only sold the collection bit by bit, but sank bit by bit to the basest ways of making money, even to blackmailing his own family in disguise. He blackmailed his brother from Australia for his little forgotten crime. That is why he took the cab to Wagga Wagga, in Putney. He blackmailed his sister for the theft he alone could have noticed. And that, by the way, is why she had that supernatural guess when he was away on the sand dunes. Mere figure and gait, however distant, are more likely to remind us of somebody than a well-made-up face quite close. There was another silence. Well, growled the detective. And so this great numismatist and coin collector was nothing but a vulgar miser. Is there so great a difference? asked Father Brown in the same strange, indulgent tone. What is there wrong about a miser that is not often as wrong about a collector? What is wrong except thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image, thou shalt not bow down to them nor serve them, for I but we must go and see how the poor young couple are getting on. I think, said Flambeau, that in spite of everything, they are probably getting on very well. CHAPTER Seven, THE PURPLE WIG Mr. Edward Nutt, the industrious editor of the Daily Reformer, sat at his desk, opening letters and marking proofs to the merry tune of a typewriter, worked by a vigorous young lady. He was a stoutish, fair man in his shirt-sleeves, his movements were resolute, his mouth firm, and his tones final. But his round, rather babyish blue eyes had a bewildered and even wistful look that rather contradicted all this. Nor, indeed, was the expression altogether misleading. It might truly be said of him, as for many journalists in authority, that his most familiar emotion was one of continuous fear. Fear of libel actions, fear of lost advertisements, fear of misprints, fear of the sack. His life was a series of distracted compromises between the proprietor of the paper and of him, who was a senile soap-boiler with three ineradicable mistakes in his mind, and the very able staff he had collected to run the paper, some of whom were brilliant and experienced men and, what was even worse, sincere enthusiasts for the political policy of the paper. 
A letter from one of these lay immediately before him, and, rapid and resolute as he was, he seemed almost to hesitate before opening it. He took up a strip of proof instead, ran down it with a blue eye and a blue pencil, altered the word adultery to the word impropriety, and the word Jew to the word alien, rang a bell, and sent it flying upstairs. Then, with a more thoughtful eye, he ripped open the letter from his more distinguished contributor, which bore a postmark of Devonshire, and read as follows. Dear Nutt, as I see you're working spooks and dukes at the same time, what about an article on that rum business of the heirs of Exmoor, or, as the old women call it down here, the devil's ear of air? The head of the family, you know, is the Duke of Exmoor. He is one of a few really stiff old Tory aristocrats left. A sound old crusted tyrant it is quite in our line to make trouble about. And I think I'm on the track of a story that will make trouble. Of course, I don't believe in the old legend about James I, and as for you, you don't believe in anything, not even in journalism. The legend, you'll probably remember, was about the blackest business in English history, the poisoning of Overbury by that witch's cat Francis Howard, and the quite mysterious terror which forced the king to pardon the murderers. There was a lot of alleged witchcraft mixed up with it, and the story goes that a manservant listening at the keyhole heard the truth in a talk between the king and Carr, and the bodily ear with which he heard grew large and monstrous, as by magic, so awful was the secret. And though he had to be loaded with lands and gold and made an ancestor of dukes, the elf-shaped ear is still recurrent in the family. Well, you don't believe in black magic, and if you did, you couldn't use it for copy. If a miracle happened in your office, you'd have to hush it up. Now so many bishops are agnostics. But that's not the point. The point is that there really is something queer about Exmoor and his family. Something quite natural, I dare say, but quite abnormal. And the ear is in it somehow, I fancy, either a symbol or a delusion or a disease or something. Another tradition says that cavaliers just after James I began to wear their hair long only to cover the ear of the first Lord Exmoor. This is also no doubt fanciful. The reason I point it out to you is this. It seems to me that we make a mistake in attacking aristocracy entirely for its champagne and diamonds. Most men rather admire the knobs for having a good time. But I think we surrender too much when we admit that aristocracy has made even the aristocrats happy. I suggest a series of articles pointing out how dreary, how inhuman, how downright diabolist is the very smell and atmosphere of some of these great houses. There are plenty of instances, but you couldn't begin with a better one than the ear of the heirs. By the end of the week, I think I can get you the truth about it. Yours ever, Francis Finn. Mr. Nutt reflected a moment, staring at his left boot. Then he called out in a strong, loud, and entirely lifeless voice, in which every syllable sounded alike, Miss Barlow, take down a letter to Mr. Finn, please. Dear Finn, I think it would do. Copy should reach a second post Saturday. Yours, E. Nutt. This elaborate epistle he articulated as if it were all one word, and Miss Barlow rattled it down as if it were all one word. Then he took up another strip of proof, and a blue pencil, and altered the word supernatural to the word marvellous, and the expression shoot down to the expression repress. In such happy, healthful activities did Mr. Nutt disport himself, until the ensuing Saturday found him at the same desk, dictating to the same typist, and using the same blue pencil on the first instalment of Mr. Finn's revelations. The opening was a sound piece of slashing invective about the evil secrets of princes, and despair in the high places of the earth. Though written violently, it was in excellent English but the editor, as usual, had given to somebody else the task of breaking it up into subheadings, which were of a spicier sort, as Pieress and Poisons, and The Eerie Ear, and The Airs in Their Eerie, and so on, through a hundred happy changes. Then followed the legend of the ear, amplified from Finn's first letter, and then the substance of his later discoveries, as follows. I know it is the practice of journalists 
to put the end of the story at the beginning and call it a headline. I know that journalism largely consists in saying Lord Jones dead to people who never knew that Lord Jones was alive. Your present correspondent thinks that this, like many other journalistic customs, is bad journalism, and that the Daily Reformer has to set a better example in such things. He proposes to tell his story as it occurred, step by step. He will use the real names of the parties, who, in most cases, are ready to confirm his testimony. As for the headlines, the sensational proclamations, they will come at the end. I was walking along a public path that leads through a private Devonshire orchard, and seems to point towards Devonshire cider, when I came suddenly upon just such a place as the path suggested. It was a long, low inn, consisting really of a cottage and two barns, thatched all over with a thatch that looks like brown and grey hair grown before history. But outside the door was a sign which called it the Blue Dragon, and under the sign was one of those long, rustic tables that used to stand outside most of the free English inns, before teetotalers and brewers between them destroyed freedom. And at this table sat three gentlemen, who might have lived a hundred years ago. Now that I know them all better, there is no difficulty about disentangling the impressions, but just then they looked like three very solid ghosts. A dominant figure, both because he was bigger in all three dimensions, and because he sat centrally in the length of the table, facing me, was a tall, fat man, dressed completely in black, with a rubicund, even apoplectic visage, but a rather bald and rather bothered brow. Looking at him again, more strictly, I could not exactly say what it was that gave me the sense of antiquity, except the antique cut of his white clerical necktie and the barred wrinkles across his brow. It was even less easy to fix the impression in the case of the man at the right end of the table, who, to say truth, was as commonplace a person as could be seen anywhere, with a round, brown-haired head and a round, stub nose, but also clad in clerical black, of a stricter cut. It was only when I saw his broad, curved hat lying on the table beside him that I realised why I connected him with anything ancient. He was a Roman Catholic priest. Perhaps the third man, at the other end of the table, had really more to do with it than the rest, though he was both slighter in physical presence and more inconsiderate in dress. His lank limbs were clad, I might also say clutched, in very tight grey sleeves and pantaloons. He had a long, sallow, aquiline face, which seemed somehow all the more saturnine because his lantern jaws were imprisoned in his collar and neckcloth more in the style of the old stock, and his hair, which ought to have been dark brown, was of an odd, dim, russet colour which, in conjunction with his yellow face, looked rather purple than red. The unobtrusive yet unusual colour was all the more notable because his hair was almost unnaturally healthy and curling, and he wore it full. But, after all analysis, I inclined to think that what gave me my first old-fashioned impression was simply a set of tall, old-fashioned wine-glasses, one or two lemons, and two church-warden pipes, and also perhaps the old-world errand on which I had come. Being a hardened reporter, and it being apparently a public inn, I did not need to summon much of my impudence to sit down at the long table and order some cider. The big man in black seemed very learned, especially about local antiquities. The small man in black, though he talked much less, surprised me with a yet wider culture, so we got on very well together. But the third man, the old gentleman in the tight pantaloons, seemed rather distant and haughty, until I slid into the subject of the Duke of Exmoor and his ancestry. I thought the subject seemed to embarrass the other two a little, but it broke the spell of the third man's silence most successfully. Speaking with restraint, and with the accent of a highly educated gentleman, and puffing at intervals at his long church-warden pipe, he proceeded to tell me some of the most horrible stories I have ever heard in my life. How one of the heirs in the former ages had hanged his own father, and another had his wife scourged at the cart-tail through the village, and another had set fire to a church full of children, and so on. 
Some of the tales, indeed, are not fit for public print, such as the story of the Scarlet Nuns, the abominable story of the Spotted Dog, or the thing that was done in the quarry. And all this red doll of impieties came from thin, genteel lips rather primly than otherwise, as he sat sipping the wine out of his tall, thin glass. I could see that the man opposite me was trying, if anything, to stop him, but he evidently held the old gentleman in considerable respect, and could not venture to do so at all abruptly. And the little priest at the other end of the table, though free from any such air of embarrassment, looked steadily at the table, and seemed to listen to the recital with great pain, as well he might. "'You don't seem,' I said to the narrator, "'to be very fond of the Exmoor pedigree.' He looked at me a moment, his lips still prim, but whitening and tightening. Then he deliberately broke his long pipe and glass on the table, and stood up, the very picture of a perfect gentleman, with the framing temper of a fiend. "'These gentlemen,' he said, "'will tell you whether I have cause to like it. The curse of the heirs of old has lain heavy on this country, and many have suffered from it. They know there are none who have suffered from it as I have.' and with that he crashed a piece of the fallen glass under his heel, and strode away among the green twilight of the twinkling apple-trees. "'That's an extraordinary old gentleman,' I said to the other two. "'Do you happen to know what the Exmoor family has done to him? Who is he?' The big man in black was staring at me with the wild air of a baffled bull. He did not at first seem to take it in. Then he said at last, "'Don't you know who he is?' I reaffirmed my ignorance, and there was another silence. Then the little priest said, still looking at the table, "'That's the Duke of Exmoor.' Then, before I could collect my scattered senses, he added, equally quietly, but with an air of regularising things, "'My friend here is Dr. Mull, the Duke's librarian. My name is Brown.' "'But,' I stammered, "'if that is the Duke, why does he damn all the old Dukes like that?' He seems really to believe, answered the priest called Brown, that they have left a curse on him. Then he added with some irrelevance, that's why he wears a wig. It was a few moments before his meaning dawned on me. You don't mean that fable about the fantastic ear, I demanded. I've heard it, of course, but surely it must be a superstitious yarn spun out of something much simpler. I've sometimes thought it was a wild version of one of those mutilation stories. They used to crop criminals' ears in the sixteenth century. "'I hardly think it was that,' answered the little man thoughtfully. "'But it is not outside ordinary science or natural law for a family to have some deformity frequently reappearing, such as one ear bigger than the other.' The big librarian had buried his bald brow in his big red hands, like a man trying to think out his duty. "'No,' he groaned, "'you do the man a wrong after all. Understand, I've no reason to defend him, or even keep faith with him. He has been a tyrant to me, as to everybody else. Don't fancy, because you see him sitting here, that he isn't a great lord in the worst sense of the word. He would fetch a man a mile to ring a bell a yard off, if it would summon another man three miles to fetch a matchbox three yards off. He must have a footman to carry his walking-stick, a body-servant to hold up his opera-glasses, but not a valet to brush his clothes, cut in the priest, with a curious dryness, for the valet would want to brush his wig, too. The librarian turned to him, and seemed to forget my presence. He was strongly moved, and, I think, a little heated with wine. "'I don't know how you know it, Father Brown,' he said, "'but you're right. He lets the whole world do everything for him, except dress him, and that he insists on doing in a literal solitude like a desert.' Anybody is kicked out of the house without a character who is so much as found near his dressing-room door. "'He seems a pleasant old party,' I remarked. "'No,' replied Dr. Mull, quite simply, "'and yet that is just what I mean by saying you are unjust to him after all. Gentlemen, the Duke does really feel the bitterness about the curse that he uttered just now. He does with sincere shame and terror hide under that purple wig something he thinks it would blast the sons of man to see.' I know it is so, and I know it is not a mere natural disfigurement, like a criminal mutilation, or a hereditary disproportion in the features. I know it is worse than that, because a man told me he was present at a scene that no man could invent. 
where a stronger man than any of us tried to defy the secret and was scared away from it. I opened my mouth to speak, but Mull went on in oblivion of me, speaking out of the cavern of his hands. I don't mind telling you, father, because it's really more defending the poor duke than giving him away. Didn't you ever hear of the time when he very nearly lost all his estates? The priest shook his head, and the librarian proceeded to tell the tale as he had heard it from his predecessor in the same post, who had been his patron and instructor, and whom he seemed to trust implicitly. Up to a certain point it was a common enough tale of the decline of a great family's fortunes, the tale of a family lawyer. His lawyer, however, had the sense to cheat honestly, if the expression explains itself. Instead of using funds he held in trust, he took advantage of the Duke's carelessness to put the family in a financial hole, in which it might be necessary for the Duke to let him hold them in reality. The lawyer's name was Isaac Green but the Duke always called him Elisha, presumably in reference to the fact that he was quite bald, though certainly not more than thirty. He had risen very rapidly, but from very dirty beginnings, being at first a narc or informer, and then a money-lender. But as a solicitor to the heirs, he had the sense, as I say, to keep technically straight until he was ready to deal the final blow. The blow fell at dinner, and the old librarian, said he should never forget the very look of the lampshades and the decanters, as the little lawyer, with a steady smile, proposed to the great landlord that they should halve the estates between them. The sequel certainly could not be overlooked, for the Duke, in dead silence, smashed a decanter on the man's bald head as suddenly as I had seen him smash the glass that day in the orchard. It left a red triangular scar on the scalp, and the lawyer's eyes altered but not his smile. He rose, tottering to his feet, and struck back as such men do strike. I'm glad of that, he said, for now I can take the whole estate. The law will give it to me. Exmoor, it seems, was white as ashes, but his eyes still blazed. The law will give it to you, he said, but you will not take it. Why not? Why? Because it would mean the crack of doom for me, and if you take it I shall take off my wig. Why, you pitiful plucked fowl! Anyone can see your bare head, but no man shall see mine and live. Well, you may say what you like, and make it mean what you like. But Mel swears it is the solemn fact that the lawyer, after shaking his knotted fists in the air for an instant, simply ran from the room, and never reappeared in the countryside. And since then Exmoor has been feared more for a warlock than even for a landlord and a magistrate. Now Dr. Mull told his story with rather wild theatrical gestures, and with passion, I think, at least partisan. I was quite conscious of the possibility that the whole was the extravagance of an old braggart and gossip. But before I end this half of my discoveries, I think it due to Dr. Mull to record that my first two inquiries have confirmed his story. I learned from an old apothecary in the village that there was a bald man in evening dress, giving the name of Green, who came to him one night to have a three-cornered cut on his forehead plastered. And I learnt from the legal records and old newspapers that there was a lawsuit threatened, and at least begun, by one Green against the Duke of Exmoor. Mr. Nutt of the Daily Reformer wrote some highly incongruous words across the top of the copy, made some highly mysterious marks down the side of it, and called to Miss Barlow in the same loud, monotonous voice, take down a letter to Mr. Finn. Dear Finn, your copy will do, but I have had to headline it a bit, and our public would never stand a Romanist priest in the story. You must keep your eye on the suburbs. I have altered him to Mr. Brown, a spiritualist. Yours, E. Nutt. A day or two afterwards found the active and judicious editor examining, with blue eyes that seemed to grow rounder and rounder, the second instalment of Mr. Finn's tale, of mysteries in high life. It began with the words, I have made an astounding discovery. I freely confess it is quite different from anything I expected to discover, and will give a much more practical shock to the public. I venture to say, without any vanity, that the words I now write will be read all over Europe, and certainly all over America and the colonies. 
and yet I heard all I have to tell before I left this same little wooden table in this same little wood of apple trees. I owe it all to the small priest Brown. He's an extraordinary man. The big librarian had left the table, perhaps ashamed of his long tongue, perhaps anxious about the storm in which his mysterious master had vanished. Anyway, he betook himself heavily in the duke's tracks through the trees. Father Brown had picked up one of the lemons and was eyeing it with an odd pleasure. "'What a lovely colour a lemon is,' he said. "'There's one thing I don't like about the duke's wig, the colour. "'I don't think I understand,' I answered. "'I dare say he's got good reason to cover his ears, like King Midas,' went on the priest, with a cheerful simplicity which somehow seemed rather flippant under the circumstances. "'I can quite understand that it's nicer to cover them with hair than with brass plates or leather flaps. "'But if he wants to use hair, why doesn't he make it look like hair? "'There never was a hair of that colour in this world. "'It looks more like a sunset cloud coming through the wood. "'Why doesn't he conceal the family curse better if he's really so ashamed of it?' "'Shall I tell you? "'It's because he isn't ashamed of it. He's proud of it.' "'It's an ugly wig to be proud of, and an ugly story,' I said. "'Consider,' replied this curious little man, "'how you yourself really feel about such things. "'I don't suggest you're either more snobbish or more morbid than the rest of us, "'but don't you feel in a vague way that a genuine old family curse "'is rather a fine thing to have? "'Would you be ashamed, wouldn't you be a little proud?' if the heir of the Glam's horror called you his friend, or if Byron's family had confided to you only the evil adventures of their race? Don't be too hard on the aristocrats themselves, if their heads are as weak as ours would be, and they are snobs about their own sorrows. By Jove, I cried, and that's true enough. My own mother's family had a banshee, and now I come to think of it, it has comforted me in many a cold hour. And think, he went on, of that stream of blood and poison that spurted from his thin lips the instant you so much as mentioned his ancestors. Why should he show every stranger over such a chamber of horrors unless he's proud of it? He doesn't conceal his wig, he doesn't conceal his blood, he doesn't conceal his family curse, he doesn't conceal the family crimes, but— The little man's voice changed so suddenly, he shut his hands so sharply, and his eyes so rapidly grew rounder and brighter like a waking owl's, that it had all the abruptness of a small explosion on the table. But, he ended, he does really conceal his toilet. It somehow completed the thrill of my fanciful nerves, that at that instant the Duke appeared again silently among the glimmering trees, with soft foot and sunset-hued hair, coming around the corner of the house in company with his librarian. Before he came within earshot, Father Brown had added quite composedly, Why does he really hide the secret of what he does with a purple wig? Because it isn't the sort of secret we suppose. The Duke came round the corner and resumed his seat at the head of the table with all his native dignity. The embarrassment of the librarian left him hovering on his hind legs like a huge bear. The Duke addressed the priest with great seriousness. "'Father Brown,' he said, "'Dr. Mull informs me that you have come here to make a request. "'I no longer profess an observance of the religion of my fathers, "'but for their sakes and for the sake of the days when we met before, "'I am very willing to hear you, "'but I presume you would rather be heard in private.' "'Whatever I retain of the gentleman made me stand up. "'Whatever I have attained of the journalist made me stand still.' Before this paralysis could pass, the priest had made a momentarily detaining motion. If, he said, your grace will permit me my real petition, or if I retain any right to advise you, I would urge that as many people as possible should be present. All over this country I have found hundreds, even of my faith and flock, whose imaginations are poisoned by the spell which I implore you to break. I wish we could have all Devonshire here to see you do it. "'To see me do what?' asked the Duke, arching his eyebrows. "'To see you take off your wig,' said Father Brown. The Duke's face did not move, but he looked at his petitioner with a glassy stare, which was the most awful expression I have ever seen on a human face. 
I could see the librarian's great legs wavering under him like the shadows of stems in a pool, and I could not banish from my own brain the fancy that the trees all around us were filling softly in the silence with devils instead of birds. "'I spare you,' said the Duke, in a voice of inhuman pity. "'I refuse. If I gave you the faintest hint of the load of horror I have to bear alone, you would lie shrieking at these feet of mine and begging to know no more. I will spare you the hint. You shall not spell the first letter of what is written on the altar of the unknown God.' "'I know the unknown God,' said the little priest, with an unconscious grandeur of certitude that stood up like a granite tower. "'I know his name. It is Satan. The true God was made flesh and dwelt among us. And I say to you, wherever you find men ruled merely by mystery, it is the mystery of iniquity. If the devil tells you something is too fearful to look at, look at it. If he says something is too terrible to hear, hear it. If you think some truth unbearable, bear it. I entreat your grace to end this nightmare now and here at this table. If I did, said the Duke in a low voice, you and all you believe, and all by which alone you live, would be the first to shrivel and perish. You would have an instant to know the great nothing before you died. The cross of Christ be between me and harm, said Father Brown. Take off your wig. I was leaning over the table in ungovernable excitement. In listening to this extraordinary duel, half a thought had come into my head. "'Your Grace,' I cried, "'I call your bluff. Take off your wig, or I will knock it off.' I admit that, whilst wrestling, I shut my eyes as it fell. I was awakened by a cry from Mull, who was also by this time at the Duke's side. His head and mine were both bending over the bald head of the wigless Duke. Then the silence was snapped by the librarian exclaiming, "'What can it mean? Why, the man had nothing to hide. His ears are just like everybody else's.' "'Yes,' said Father Brown. "'That's what he had to hide.' The priest walked straight up to him, but strangely enough did not even glance at his ears. He stared with an almost comical seriousness at his bald forehead, and pointed to a three-cornered cicatrice, long-heeled but still discernible. "'Mr. Green, I think,' he said politely. And he did get the whole estate after all. And now let me tell the readers of the Daily Reformer what I think the most remarkable thing in the whole affair. This transformation scene, which will seem to you as wild and purple as a Persian fairy tale, has been, except for my technical assault, strictly legal and constitutional from its beginnings. The man with the odd scar and the ordinary ears is not an impostor, though in one sense he wears another man's wig and claims another man's ear. He has not stolen another man's coronet. He really is the one and only Duke of Exmoor. What happened was this. The old Duke really had a slight malformation of the ear, which really was more or less hereditary. He really was morbid about it, and it is likely enough that he did invoke it as a kind of curse in the violent scene which undoubtedly happened, in which he struck Green with the decanter. But the contest ended very differently. Green pressed his claim and got the estates. The dispossessed nobleman shot himself and died without issue. After a decent interval the beautiful English government revived the extinct peerage of Exmoor, and bestowed it, as is usual, on the most important person, the person who's got the property. This man used the old feudal fables properly in his snobbish soul, really envied and admired them, so that thousands of poor English people trembled before a mysterious chieftain with an ancient destiny and a diadem of evil stars, when they are really trembling before a gutter snipe who was a pettifogger and a pawnbroker not twelve years ago. I think it is very typical of the real case against our aristocracy as it is, and it will be till God sends us braver men. Mr. Nutt put down the manuscript and called out with unusual sharpness, "'Miss Barlow, please take down a letter to Mr. Finn.' "'Dear Finn, you must be mad. We can't touch this. I wanted vampires and the bad old days and aristocracy hand in hand with superstition. They like that. But you must know the Exmoors would never forgive this. 
"'And what would our people say then, I should like to know why, "'Sir Simon is one of Exmoor's greatest pals, "'and it would ruin that cousin of the heirs "'that's standing for us at Bradford. "'Besides, old Soapsuds was sick enough "'at not getting his peerage last year. "'He'd sack me by wire if I lost him it "'with such lunacy as this. "'And what about Duffy? "'He's doing us some rattling articles "'on the heel of the Norman, "'and how can he write about Normans "'if the man's only a solicitor? "'Do be reasonable. "'Yours, E. Nutt.' As Miss Barlow rattled away cheerfully, he crumpled up the copy and tossed it into the waste-paper basket, but not before he had, automatically and by force of habit, altered the word God to the word circumstances. CHAPTER Eight: THE PERISHING OF THE PENDRAGONS Father Brown was in no mood for adventures. He had lately fallen ill with overwork, and when he began to recover, his friend Flambeau had taken him on a cruise in a small yacht with Sir Cecil Fanshawe, a young Cornish squire and an enthusiast for Cornish coast scenery. But Brown was still rather weak. He was no very happy sailor. And though he was never of the sort that either grumbles or breaks down, his spirits did not rise above patience and civility. When the other two men praised the ragged violet sunset or the ragged volcanic crags, he agreed with them. When Flambeau pointed out a rock shaped like a dragon, he looked at it and thought it very like a dragon. When Mr. Fanshawe more excitedly indicated a rock that was like Merlin, he looked at it and signified assent. When Flambeau asked whether this rocky gate of the twisted river was not the gate of fairyland, he said, yes. He heard the most important things and the most trivial with the same tasteless absorption. He heard that the coast was deaf to all but careful seamen. He also heard that the ship's cat was asleep. He heard that Fanshawe couldn't find his cigar holder anywhere, and he also heard the pilot deliver the oracle, both eyes bright, she's all right, one eye winks, down she sinks. He heard Flambeau say to Fanshawe that no doubt this meant the pilot must keep both eyes open and be spry. And he heard Fanshawe say to Flambeau that, oddly enough, it didn't mean this. It meant that while they saw two of the coast lights, one near and the other distant, exactly side by side, they were in the right river channel. But if one light was hidden behind the other, they were going on the rocks. He heard Fanshawe add that his country was full of such quaint fables and idioms. It was the very home of romance. He even pitted this part of Cornwall against Devonshire as a claimant to the laurels of Elizabethan seamanship. According to him, there had been captains among these coves and islets compared with whom Drake was practically a landsman. He heard Flambeau laugh and ask if, perhaps, the adventurous title of Westwood Ho only meant that all Devonshire men wished they were living in Cornwall. He heard Fanshawe say, there was no need to be silly, that not only had Cornish captains been heroes, but they were heroes still, that near that very spot there was an old admiral, now retired, who was scarred by thrilling voyages full of adventures, and who had, in his youth, found the last group of eight Pacific islands that was added to the chart of the world. This Cecil Fanshawe was, in person, of the kind that commonly urges such crude but pleasing enthusiasms, a very young man, light-haired, high-coloured, with an eager profile, with a boyish bravado of spirits, but an almost girlish delicacy of tint and type. The big shoulders, black brows, and black mousquetaire swagger of Flambeau were a great contrast. All these trivialities Brown heard and saw but heard them as a tired man hears a tune in the railway wheels, or saw them as a sick man sees the pattern of his wallpaper. No one can calculate the turns of mood in convalescence, but Father Brown's depression must have had a great deal to do with his mere unfamiliarity with the sea. For as the river mouth narrowed like the neck of a bottle, and the water grew calmer and the air warmer and more earthly, he seemed to wake up and take notice like a baby. They had reached that phase just after sunset, when air and water both look bright, but earth and all its growing things look almost black by comparison. About this particular evening, however, there was something exceptional. 
It was one of those rare atmospheres in which a smoked glass slide seems to have been slid away from between us and nature, so that even dark colours on that day look more gorgeous than bright colours on cloudier days. The trampled earth of the river banks and the peaty stain in the pools did not look drab but glowing umber, and the dark woods astir in the breeze did not look as usual dim blue with mere depth of distance, but more like wind-tumbled masses of some vivid violet blossom. This magic clearness and intensity in the colours was further forced on Brown's slowly reviving senses by something romantic and even secret in the very form of the landscape. The river was still well wide and deep enough for a pleasure boat so small as theirs, but the curves of the countryside suggested that it was closing in on either hand. The woods seemed to be making broken and flying attempts at bridge-building, as if the boat were passing from the romance of a valley to the romance of a hollow, and so to the supreme romance of a tunnel. Beyond this mere look of things there was little for Brown's freshening fancy to feed on. He saw no human beings except some gypsies trailing along the river-bank, with faggots and osiers cut in the forest. And one sight no longer unconventionable but in such remote parts still uncommon, a dark-haired lady, bareheaded and paddling her own canoe. If Father Brown ever attached any importance to either of these, he certainly forgot them at the next turn of the river, which brought in sight a singular object. The water seemed to widen and split, being cloven by the dark wedge of a fish-shaped and wooded islet. With the rate at which they went, the islet seemed to swim towards them like a ship, a ship with a very high prow, or, to speak more strictly, a very high funnel, for at the extreme point nearest them stood up an odd-looking building, unlike any they could remember or connect with any purpose. It was not specially high, but it was too high for its breadth to be called anything but a tower. Yet it appeared to be built entirely of wood, and that in a most unequal and eccentric way. Some of the planks and beams were of good seasoned oak, some of such wood cut raw and recent, some again of white pine wood, and a great deal more of the same sort of wood painted black with tar. These black beams were set crooked or criss-cross at all kinds of angles, giving the whole a most patchy and puzzling appearance. There were one or two windows, which appeared to be coloured and leaded in an old-fashioned but more elaborate style. The travellers looked at it with that paradoxical feeling we have when something reminds us of something, and yet we are certain it is something very different. Father Brown, even when he was mystified, was clever in analysing his own mystification, and he found himself reflecting that the oddity seemed to consist in a particular shape cut out in an incongruous material, as if one saw a top hat made of tin or a frock coat cut out of tartan. He was sure he had seen timbers of different tints arranged like that somewhere, but never in such architectural proportions. The next moment a glimpse through the dark trees told him all he wanted to know, and he laughed. Through a gap in the foliage there appeared for a moment one of those old wooden houses, faced with black beams, which are still to be found here and there in England, but which most of us see imitated in some show called Old London or Shakespeare's England. It was in view only long enough for the priest to see that, however old-fashioned, it was a comfortable and well-kept country house, with flower-beds in front of it. It had none of the piebald and crazy look of the tower that seemed made out of its refuse. "'What on earth this?' said Flambeau, who was still staring at the tower. Fanshawe's eyes were shining, and he spoke triumphantly. "'Aha! You've not seen a place quite like this before, I fancy. That's why I've brought you here, my friend.' Now you shall see whether I exaggerate about the mariners of Cornwall. This place belongs to old Pendragon, whom we call the Admiral, though he retired before getting the rank. A spirit of Raleigh and Hawkins is a memory with the Devon folk. It's a modern fact with the Pendragons. If Queen Elizabeth were to rise from the grave and come up this river in a gilded barge, she would be received by the Admiral in a house exactly such as she was accustomed to, 
in every corner and casement, in every panel on the wall or plate on the table, and she would find an English captain still talking fiercely of fresh lands to be found in little ships, as much as if she had dined with Drake. She'd find a rum sort of thing in the garden, said Father Brown, which would not please her in Nason's eye. That Elizabethan domestic architecture is charming in its way, but it's against the very nature of it to break out into turrets. And yet, answered Fanshawe, that's the most romantic and Elizabethan part of the business. It was built by the Pendragons in the very days of the Spanish Wars, and though it's needed patching and even rebuilding for another reason, it's always been rebuilt in the old way. The story goes that the lady of Sir Peter Pendragon built it in this place and to this height, because from the top you can just see the corner where vessels turn into the river mouth, and she wished to be the first to see her husband's ship as he sailed home from the Spanish main. For what other reason, asked Father Brown, do you mean that it has been rebuilt? Oh, there's a strange story about that too, said the young squire, with relish. You are really in a land of strange stories. King Arthur was here, and Merlin and the fairies before him. The story goes that Sir Peter Pendragon, who, I fear, had some of the faults of the pirates as well as the virtues of the sailor, was bringing home three Spanish gentlemen in honourable captivity, intending to escort them to Elizabeth's court. But he was a man of flaming and tigerish temper, and, coming to high words with one of them, he caught him by the throat and flung him, by accident or design, into the sea. The second Spaniard, who was the brother of the first, instantly drew his sword and flew at Pendragon, and after a short but furious combat, in which both got three wounds in as many minutes, Pendragon drove his blade through the other's body, and the second Spaniard was accounted for. As it happened, the ship had already turned into the river mouth, and was close to comparatively shallow water. The third Spaniard sprang over the side of the ship, struck out for the shore, and was soon near enough to it to stand up to his waist in water. And, turning again to face the ship, and holding up both arms to heaven, like a prophet calling plagues upon a wicked city, he called out to Pendragon in a piercing and terrible voice that he at least was yet living, that he would go on living, that he would live for ever, and that generation after generation the house of Pendragon should never see him or his, but should know by very certain signs that he and his vengeance were alive. With that he dived under the wave, and was either drowned or swam so long under water that no hair of his head was seen afterwards. "'There's that girl in the canoe again,' said Flambeau, irrelevantly, for good-looking young women would call him off any topic. She seems bothered by the queer tower just as we were. Indeed, the black-haired young lady was letting her canoe float slowly and silently past the strange islet, and was looking intently up at the strange tower, with a strong glow of curiosity on her oval and olive face. "'Never mind, girls,' said Fanshawe impatiently. "'There are plenty of them in the world, but not many things like the Pendragon Tower. As you may easily suppose, plenty of superstitions and scandals have followed in the track of the Spaniard's curse.' and no doubt, as you would put it, any accident happening to this Cornish family would be connected with it by rural credulity. But it is perfectly true that this tower has been burnt down two or three times, and the family can't be called lucky, for more than two, I think, of the Admiral's near kin have perished by shipwreck, and one, at least to my own knowledge, on practically the same spot where Sir Peter threw the Spaniard overboard. "'What a pity!' exclaimed Flambeau. "'She's going.' "'When did your friend the Admiral tell you this family history?' asked Father Brown, as the girl in the canoe paddled off, without showing the least intention of extending her interest from the tower to the yacht, which Fanshawe had already caused to lie alongside the island. "'Many years ago,' replied Fanshawe, "'he hasn't been to sea for some time now, though he is as keen on it as ever.' I believe there's a family compact or something. Well, here's the landing stage. Let's come ashore and see the old boy. They followed him on to the island, just under the tower, and Father Brown, whether from mere touch of dry land or the interest of something on the other bank of the river, which he stared at very hard for some second, 
seemed singularly improved in briskness. They entered a wooded avenue between two fences of thin, greyish wood, such as often enclose parks or gardens, and over the top of which the dark trees tossed to and fro like black and purple plumes upon the hearse of a giant. The tower, as they left it behind, looked all the quainter, because such entrances are usually flanked by two towers, and this one looked lopsided. But for this the avenue had the usual appearance of the entrance to a gentleman's grounds, and, being so curved that the house was now out of sight, somehow looked a much larger park than any plantation on such an island could really be. Father Brown was, perhaps, a little fanciful in his fatigue, but he almost thought the whole place must be growing larger, as things do in a nightmare. Anyhow, a mystical monotony was the only character of their march, until Fanshawe suddenly stopped and pointed to something sticking out through the grey fence. Something that looked at first like the imprisoned horn of some beast. Closer observation showed that it was a slightly curved blade of metal that shone faintly in the fading light. Flambeau, who, like all Frenchmen, had been a soldier, bent over it and said in a startled voice, "'Why, it's a sabre. I believe I know the sort, heavy and curved, but shorter than the cavalry. They used to have them in the artillery, and the—' As he spoke, the blade plucked itself out of the crack it had made, and came down again with a more ponderous slash, splitting the fissiparous fence to the bottom with a rending noise. Then it was pulled out again, flashed above the fence some feet further along, and again split it halfway down with the first stroke. And, after waggling a little to extricate itself, accompanied with curses in the darkness, split it down to the ground with a second. Then a kick of devilish energy sent the whole loosened square of thin wood flying into the pathway, and a great gap of dark coppice gaped in the paling. Fanshawe peered into the dark opening, and uttered an exclamation of astonishment. "'My dear Admiral,' he exclaimed, "'do you, uh, do you generally cut out a new front door whenever you want to go for a walk?' The voice in the gloom swore again, and then broke into a jolly laugh. "'No,' it said. "'I've really got to cut down this fence somehow. It's spoiling all the plants, and no one else here can do it. But I'll only carve another bit off the front door, and then come out and welcome you.' And, sure enough, he heaved up his weapon once more, and, hacking twice, brought down another and similar strip of fence, making the opening about fourteen feet wide in all. Then through this larger forest gateway he came out into the evening light, with a chip of grey wood sticking to his sword-blade. He momentarily fulfilled all Fanshawe's fable of an old piratical admiral, though the details seemed afterwards to decompose into accidents. For instance, he wore a broad-brimmed hat as protection against the sun, but the front flap of it was turned up straight to the sky, and the two corners pulled down lower than the ears, so that it stood across his forehead in a crescent, like the old cocked hat worn by Nelson. He wore an ordinary dark blue jacket with nothing special about the buttons, but the combination of it with white linen trousers somehow had a sailorish look. He was tall and loose, and walked with a sort of swagger which was not a sailor's role, and yet somehow suggested it. And he held in his hand a short sabre, which was like a navy cutlass, but about twice as big. Under the bridge of the hat his eagle face looked eager, all the more because it was not only clean-shaven, but without eyebrows. It seemed almost as if all the hair had come off his face, from his thrusting it through a throng of elements. His eyes were prominent and piercing, his colour was curiously attractive, while partly tropical. It reminded one vaguely of a blood orange. That is, that while it was ruddy and sanguine, there was a yellow in it that was in no way sickly, but seemed rather to glow like gold apples of the Hesperides. Father Brown thought he had never seen a figure so expressive of all the romances about the countries of the sun. When Fanshawe had presented his two friends to their host, he fell again into a tone of rallying the latter about his wreckage of the fence and his apparent rage of profanity. The Admiral pooh-poohed it at first as a piece of necessary but annoying garden work, but at length the ring of real energy came back into his laughter, and he cried with a mixture of impatience and good humour, 
Well, perhaps I do go at it a bit rabidly, and feel a kind of pleasure in smashing anything. So would you, if your only pleasure was in cruising about to find some new cannibal islands, and you had to stick on this muddy little rockery in a sort of rustic pond. When I remember how I've cut down a mile and a half of green, poisonous jungle with an old cutlass half as sharp as this, and then remember I must stop here and chop this matchwood, because of some confounded old bargain scribbled in a family Bible, why I— he swung up the heavy steel again, and this time sundered the wall of wood from top to bottom at one stroke. "'I feel like that,' he said, laughing, but furiously flinging the sword some yards down the path. "'And now let's go up to the house. You must have some dinner.' The semicircle of lawn in front of the house was varied by three circular garden beds, one of red tulips, a second of yellow tulips, and the third of some white, waxen-looking blossoms that the visitors did not know and presumed to be exotic. A heavy, hairy, and rather sullen-looking gardener was hanging up a heavy coil of garden hose. The corners of the expiring sunset, which seemed to cling about the corners of the house, gave glimpses here and there of the colours of remoter flower-beds, and in a treeless space on one side of the house, opening upon the river, stood a tall brass tripod, on which was tilted a big brass telescope. Just outside the steps of the porch stood a little painted green garden table, as if someone had just taken tea there. The entrance was flanked with two of those half-featured lumps of stone with holes for eyes that are said to be South Sea idols, and on the brown oak beam across the doorway were some confused carvings that looked almost barbaric. As they passed indoors, the little cleric hopped suddenly on to the table, and standing on it peered unaffectedly through his spectacles at the mouldings in the oak. Admiral Pendragon looked very much astonished, though not particularly annoyed, while Fanshawe was so amused with what looked like a performing pygmy on his little stand that he could not control his laughter. But Father Brown was not likely to notice either the laughter or the astonishment. He was gazing at three carved symbols, which, though very worn and obscure, seemed still to convey some sense to him. The first seemed to be the outline of some tower or other building, crowned with what looked like curly-pointed ribbons. The second was clearer, an old Elizabethan galley with decorative waves beneath it, but interrupted in the middle by a curious jagged rock, which was either a fault in the wood or some conventional representation of the water coming in. The third represented the upper half of a human figure, ending in an escalloped line, like the waves. The face was rubbed and featureless, and both arms were held very stiffly up in the air. "'Well,' muttered Father Brown, blinking, "'here is the legend of the Spaniard plain enough. Here he is, holding up his arms and cursing in the sea, and here are the two curses, the wrecked ship and the burning of Pendragon Tower. Pendragon shook his head with a kind of venerable amusement. And how many other things might it not be, he said. Don't you know that that sort of half-man, like a half-lion or half-stag, is quite common in heraldry? Might not that line through the ship be one of those party per pale lines, indented, I think they call it? And though the third thing isn't so very heraldic, it would be more heraldic to suppose it a tower crowned with laurel than with fire, and it looks just as like it. But it seems rather odd, said Flambeau, that it should exactly confirm the old legend. Ah, replied the sceptical traveller, but you don't know how much of the old legend may have been made up from the old figures. Besides, it isn't the only old legend. Fanshawe here, who is fond of such things, will tell you that there are other versions of the tale, and much more horrible ones. One story credits my unfortunate ancestor with having had the Spaniard cut in two, and that will fit the pretty picture also. Another obligingly credits our family with the possession of a tower full of snakes, and explains those little wriggly things in that way. And a third theory supposes the crooked line on the ship to be a conventionalised thunderbolt. But that alone, if seriously examined, would show what a very little way these unhappy coincidences really go. "'Why, how do you mean?' asked Fanshawe. 
It so happens, replied his host coolly, that there was no thunder and lightning at all in the two or three shipwrecks I know of in our family. Oh, said Father Brown, and jumped down from the little table. There was another silence in which they heard the continuous murmur of the river. Then Fanshawe said, in a doubtful and perhaps disappointed tone, Then you don't think there is anything in the tales of the Tower and the Flames? There are the tales, of course, said the Admiral, shrugging his shoulders, and some of them I don't deny on evidence as decent as one ever gets for such things. Someone saw a blaze hereabout, don't you know, as he walked home through a wood? Someone keeping sheep on the uplands inland thought he saw a flame hovering over Pendragon Tower? Well, a damp dab of mud like this confounded island seems the last place where one would think of fires. "'What is that fire over there?' asked Father Brown, with a gentle suddenness, pointing to the woods on the left river bank. They were all thrown a little off their balance, and the more fanciful Fanshawe had even some difficulty in recovering his, as they saw a long, thin stream of blue smoke ascending silently into the end of the evening light. Then Pendragon broke into a scornful laugh. "'Gypsies,' he said. "'They've been camping here for about a week. "'Gentlemen, you want your dinner?' And he turned as if to enter the house. But the antiquarian superstition in Fanshawe was still quivering, and he said hastily, "'But, Admiral, what's that hissing noise quite near the island? It's very like fire.' "'It's more like what it is,' said the Admiral, laughing as he led the way. It's only some canoe going by. Almost as he spoke, the butler, a lean man in black, with very black hair and a very long yellow face, appeared in the doorway and told him that dinner was served. The dining-room was as nautical as the cabin of a ship, but its note was rather that of the modern than the Elizabethan captain. There were, indeed, three antiquated cutlasses in a trophy over the fireplace, and one brown sixteenth-century map with tritons and little ships dotted about a curly sea. But such things were less prominent on the white panelling than some cases of quaint-coloured South American birds, very scientifically stuffed, fantastic shells from the Pacific, and several instruments so rude and queer in shape that savages might have used them either to kill their enemies or to cook them. But the alien colour culminated in the fact that, besides the butler, the Admiral's only servants were two Negroes, somewhat quaintly clad in tight uniforms of yellow. The priest's instinctive trick of analysing his own impressions told him that the colour and the little neat coat-tails of these bipeds had suggested the word canary, and so, by a mere pun, connected them with southward travel. Towards the end of the dinner they took their yellow clothes and black faces out of the room, leaving only the black clothes and yellow face of the butler. "'I'm rather sorry you take this so lightly,' said Fanshawe to the host, "'for the truth is I've brought these friends of mine with the idea of their helping you, "'as they know a good deal of these things. "'Don't you really believe in the family story at all?' "'I don't believe in anything,' answered Pendragon very briskly, "'with a bright eye cocked at a red tropical bird. "'I'm a man of science.' "'Rather to Flambeau's surprise, his clerical friend, who seemed to have entirely woken up, took up the digression and talked natural history with his host, with a flow of words and much unexpected information, until the dessert and decanters were set down, and the last of the servants vanished. Then he said, without altering his tone, "'Please don't think me impertinent, Admiral Pendragon. I don't ask for curiosity, but really for my guidance and your convenience. Have I made a bad shot if I guess you don't want these old things talked of before your butler?' The Admiral lifted the hairless arches over his eyes and exclaimed, "'Well, I don't know where you got it, but the truth is I can't stand the fellow, though I've no excuse for discharging a family servant. Fanshawe, with his fairy tales, would say my blood moved against men with that black, Spanish-looking hair.' Flambeau struck the table with his heavy fist. "'By Jove!' he cried. "'So had that girl!' I hope it'll all end to-night, continued the Admiral, when my nephew comes back safe from his ship. You look surprised. You won't understand, I suppose, unless I tell you the story. You see, my father had two sons. I remained a bachelor, but my elder brother married 
and had a son who became a sailor like all the rest of us, and will inherit the proper estate. Well, my father was a strange man. He somehow combined Fanshawe's superstition with a good deal of my scepticism. They were always fighting in him, and after my first voyages he developed a notion which he thought somehow would settle finally whether the curse was truth or trash. If all the Pendragons sailed about anyhow, he thought there would be too much chance of natural catastrophes to prove anything. But if we went to sea one at a time, in strict order of succession to the property, he thought it might show whether any connected fate followed the family as a family. It was a silly notion, I think, and I quarrelled with my father pretty heartily. For I was an ambitious man, and was left to the last, coming by succession after my own nephew. "'And your father and brother,' said the priest, very gently, "'died at sea, I fear.' "'Yes,' groaned the Admiral, "'by one of those brutal accidents on which are built all the lying mythologies of mankind. They were both shipwrecked. My father, coming up this coast out of the Atlantic, was washed up on these Cornish rocks. My brother's ship was sunk, no one knows where, on the voyage home from Tasmania. His body was never found. I tell you, it was from perfectly natural mishap. Lots of other people besides Pendragons were drowned, and both disasters are discussed in a normal way by navigators. But, of course, it set this forest of superstition on fire, and men saw the flaming tower everywhere. That's why I say it will be all right when Walter returns. The girl he's engaged to was coming today, but I was so afraid of some chance delay frightening her that I wired her not to come till she had heard from me. But he's practically sure to be here some time tonight, and then it'll all end in smoke. Tobacco smoke. We'll crack that old lie when we crack a bottle of this wine. Very good wine, said Father Brown, gravely lifting his glass. But as you see, a very bad wine bibber. I most sincerely beg your pardon, for he had spilt a small spot of wine on the tablecloth. He drank and put down the glass with a composed face but his hand had started at the exact moment when he became conscious of a face looking in through the garden window just behind the admiral. The face of a woman, swarthy, with southern hair and eyes, and young, but like a mask of tragedy. After a pause, the priest spoke again in his mild manner. Admiral, he said, will you do me a favour? Let me and my friends, if they like, stop in that tower of yours just for to-night. Do you know that in my business you are an exorcist almost before anything else?" Pendragon sprang to his feet, and paced swiftly to and fro across the window, from which the face had instantly vanished. "'I tell you, there is nothing in it,' he cried, with ringing violence. "'There is one thing I know about this matter. You may call me an atheist. I am an atheist.' But he swung round and fixed Father Brown with a face of frightful concentration. This business is perfectly natural. There is no curse in it at all. Father Brown smiled. In that case, he said, there can't be any objection to my sleeping in your delightful summer-house. The idea is utterly ridiculous, replied the Admiral, beating a tattoo on the back of his chair. Please forgive me for everything, said Brown, in his most sympathetic tone, including spilling the wine but it seems to me you are not quite so easy about the flaming tower as you try to be." Admiral Pendragon sat down again as abruptly as he had risen, but he sat quite still, and when he spoke again it was in a lower voice. "'You do it at your own peril,' he said. "'But wouldn't you be an atheist to keep sane in all this devilry?' Some three hours afterwards Fanshawe, Flambeau, and the priest were still dawdling about the garden in the dark, and it began to dawn on the other two that Father Brown had no intention of going to bed either in the tower or the house. "'I think the lawn wants weeding,' said he dreamily. "'If I could find a spud or something, I'd do it myself.' They followed him, laughing and half remonstrating, but he replied with the utmost solemnity, explaining to them, in a maddening little sermon, that one can always find some small occupation that is helpful to others. He did not find a spud, but he found an old broom made of twigs, with which he began energetically to brush the falling leaves off the grass. Always some little thing to be done, he said, with idiotic cheerfulness, as George Herbert says, 
who sweeps an admiral's garden in Cornwall as for thy laws, makes that and the action fine. And now, he added, suddenly slinging the broom away, let's go and water the flowers. With the same mixed emotions they watched him uncoil some considerable lengths of the large garden hose, saying, with an air of wistful discrimination, the red tulips before the yellow, I think, look a bit dry, don't you think? He turned the little tap on the instrument, and the water shot out straight and solid as a long rod of steel. "'Look out, Samson!' cried Flambeau. "'Why, you've cut off the tulip's head!' Father Brown stood ruefully contemplating the decapitated plant. "'Mine does seem to be a rather kill-or-cure sort of watering,' he admitted, scratching his head. "'I suppose it's a pity I didn't find the spud. You should have seen me with the spud. Talking of tools... You've got that sword-stick flambeau you always carry? That's right. And Sir Cecil could have that sword the Admiral threw away by the fence here. How grey everything looks. The mists rising from the river, said the staring flambeau. Almost as he spoke, the huge figure of the hairy gardener appeared on a higher ridge of the trenched and terraced lawn, hailing them with a brandished rake and a horribly bellowing voice. Put down that hose, he shouted. Put down that hose and go to your... "'I am fearfully clumsy,' replied the reverend gentleman weakly. "'Do you know I upset some wine at dinner?' He made a wavering half-turn of apology towards the gardener, with the hose still spouting in his hand. The gardener caught the cold crash of the water full in his face, like the crash of a cannonball, staggered, slipped, and went sprawling with his boots in the air. "'How very dreadful,' said Father Brown, looking round in a sort of wonder. "'Why, I've hit a man.' He stood with his head forward for a moment, as if looking or listening, and then set off at a trot towards the tower, still trailing the hose behind him. The tower was quite close, but its outline was curiously dim. "'Your river mist,' he said, "'has a rum smell.' "'By the Lord it has,' cried Fanshawe, who was very white. "'But you can't mean—' "'I mean,' said Father Brown, "'that one of the Admiral's scientific predictions is coming true to-night. "'This story is going to end in smoke.' As he spoke, a most beautiful rose-red light seemed to burst into blossom like a gigantic rose, but accompanied with a crackling and rattling noise that was like the laughter of devils. "'My God, what is it?' cried Sir Cecil Fanshawe. "'The sign of the flaming tower,' said Father Brown, and sent the driving water from his hose into the heart of the red patch. "'Lucky we haven't gone to bed,' ejaculated Fanshawe. "'I suppose it can't spread to the house.' You may remember, said the priest quietly, that the wooden fence that might have carried it was cut away. Flambeau turned electrified eyes upon his friend, but Fanshawe only said rather absently, Well, nobody can be killed, anyhow. This is rather a curious kind of tower, observed Father Brown. When it takes to killing people, it always kills people who are somewhere else. At the same instant the monstrous figure of the gardener, with the streaming beard, stood again on the green ridge against the sky, waving others to come on, but now waving not a rake but a cutlass. Behind him came the two negroes, also with the old crooked cutlasses out of the trophy. But in the blood-red glare, with their black faces and yellow figures, they looked like devils carrying instruments of torture. In the dim garden behind them a distant voice was heard calling out brief directions. When the priest heard the voice a terrible change came over his countenance. But he remained composed, and never took his eye off the patch of flame which had begun by spreading, but now seemed to shrink a little as it hissed under the torch of the long silver spear of water. He kept his finger along the nozzle of the pipe to ensure the aim, and attended to no other business knowing only by the noise and that semi-conscious corner of the eye the exciting incidents that began to tumble themselves about the island garden. He gave two brief directions to his friends. One was, knock these fellows down somehow and tie them up. Whoever they are, there's rope down by those faggots. They want to take away my nice hose. The other was, as soon as you get a chance, call out to that canoeing girl. She's over on the bank with the gypsies. Ask her if they could get some buckets across and fill them from the river. 
Then he closed his mouth and continued to water the new red flower as ruthlessly as he had watered the red tulip. He never turned his head to look at the strange fight that followed between the foes and friends of the mysterious fire. He almost felt the island shake when Flambeau collided with the huge gardener. He merely imagined how it would whirl around them as they wrestled. He heard the crashing fall, and his friend's gasp of triumph as they dashed on to the first negro, and the cries of both the blacks as Flambeau and Fanshawe bound them. Flambeau's enormous strength more than redressed the odds in the fight, especially as the fourth man still hovered near the house, only a shadow and a voice. He heard also the water broken by the paddles of a canoe, the girl's voice giving orders, the voices of gypsies answering and coming nearer, the plumping and sucking noise of empty buckets plunged into a full stream, and finally the sound of many feet around the fire. But all this was less to him than the fact that the red rent, which had lately once more increased, had once more slightly diminished. Then came a cry that very nearly made him turn his head. Flambeau and Fanshawe, now reinforced by some gypsies, had rushed after the mysterious man by the house, and he heard, from the other end of the garden, the Frenchman's cry of horror and astonishment. It was echoed by a howl not to be called human, as the being broke from their hold and ran along the garden. Three times at least it raced round the whole island in a way that was as horrible as the chase of a lunatic, both in the cries of the pursued and the ropes carried by the pursuers but was more horrible still, because it somehow suggested one of the chasing games of children in a garden. Then, finding them closing in on every side, the figure sprang upon one of the high river banks, and disappeared with a splash into the dark and driving river. "'You can do no more, I fear,' said Brown, in a voice cold with pain. "'He's been washed down to the rocks by now, where he has sent so many others. He knew the use of a family legend.' "'Oh, don't talk in these parables,' cried Flambeau impatiently. "'Can't you put it simply in words of one syllable?' "'Yes,' answered Brown, with his eye on the hose. "'Both eyes bright, she's all right. "'One eye blinks, down she sinks.' The fire hissed and shrieked more and more like a strangled thing, as it grew narrower and narrower under the flood from the pipe and the buckets. But Father Brown still kept his eye on it as he went on speaking. I thought of asking this young lady, if it were morning yet, to look through that telescope at the river mouth and the river. She might have seen something to interest her, the sign of a ship, or Mr. Walter Pendragon coming home, and perhaps even the sign of the half-man, for though he is certainly safe by now, he may very well have waded ashore. He has been within a shave of another shipwreck and would never have escaped it if the lady hadn't had the sense to suspect the old admiral's telegram and come down to watch him. Don't let's talk about the old admiral. Don't let's talk about anything. It's enough to say that whenever this tower, with its pitch and resin wood, really caught fire, the spark on the horizon always looked like the twin light to the coast lighthouse. And that, said Flambeau, is how the father and brother died. The wicked uncle of the legends very nearly got his estate after all. Father Brown did not answer. Indeed, he did not speak again, save for civilities, till they were all safe round a cigar-box in the cabin of the yacht. He saw that the frustrated fire was extinguished, and then refused to linger, though he actually heard young Pendragon, escorted by an enthusiastic crowd, come tramping up the river bank, and might, had he been moved by romantic curiosities, have received the combined thanks of the man from the ship and the girl from the canoe. But his fatigue had fallen on him once more, and he only started once when Flambeau abruptly told him he had dropped his cigar-ash on his trousers. "'That's no cigar-ash,' he said rather wearily. "'That's from the fire. But you don't think so, because you're all smoking cigars. That's just the way I got my first faint suspicion about the chart.' "'Do you mean Pendragon's chart of his Pacific Islands?' asked Fanshawe. "'You thought it was a chart of the Pacific Islands,' answered Brown. "'Put a feather with a fossil and a bit of coral, and everyone will think it's a specimen. Put the same feather with a ribbon and an artificial flower, and everyone will think it's for a lady's hat. Put the same feather with an ink-bottle, a book, 
and a stack of writing paper, and most men will swear they've seen a quill pen. So you saw the map among tropical birds and shells, and thought it was a map of Pacific Islands. It was a map of this river. But how do you know? asked Fanshawe. I saw the rock you thought was like a dragon, and the one like Merlin, and— "'You seem to have noticed a lot as we came in,' cried Fanshawe. "'We thought you were rather abstracted.' "'I was seasick,' said Father Brown simply. "'I felt simply horrible. "'But feeling horrible has nothing to do with not seeing things.' "'And he closed his eyes. "'Do you think most men would have seen that?' asked Flambeau. "'He received no answer. "'Father Brown was asleep. 